Next to him is Mr. Scott. Next to him is Mwakiesi. On my left is Majola. On his left is uh, Advocate Silie. Next to him is Sigogo and Advocate Manye. When perusing your curriculum vitae, it is very clear that uh, you are the acting national director of public prosecutions as we speak. That's correct, Chairman. And uh, you've been acting in this position since August of this year. That is correct. And before that, you were deputy national director of public prosecutions. And 2003 2013, head of national special services of the NPA. And 2013 to 2015, we're head of national prosecution services. 2015, 2018, we're head of admin and witness protection. And 2002 to 2003, we're special director of the NPA and the director of the NPA from 1998 to 2002. That's correct. So while others are still in the stable, uh, they have already bolted as the incumbent NDPP. That's a, that's a challenging one, Chairman. Okay, but I guess so. We'll recall that the panel sent you a case study. Yes. You familiarize yourself with the case study? Yes. Yeah. So I would like to ask you a question that is based on the case study. But uh, the context is the Constitution that prescribes uh, what the attributes of a national director of public prosecutions must be, as well as the NPA Act, as well as the NPA Code of Conduct, and various uh, judgments of our courts, in particular the Concord decision. So in responding to us on the case study, I would like you to deal specifically with uh, the issue of you being a fit and proper person in terms of experience, conscientiousness, integrity, service delivery, and how you are exercising your role if you are appointed without fear, favor, or prejudice, as well as what is contained in the uh, NPA Act, that you must act professionally, free from political, public, as well as judicial interference. I just want to bring to our attention one of the Concord decision that uh, said in a familiar case that I'm sure you are aware of, that ignoring prima facie indications of dishonesty a wholly, is wholly inconsistent with the end sought to be achieved namely the appointment of a national director who is sufficiently conscientious and has enough credibility to do this important job effectively. So the context here is an institution that uh, in terms of the public opinion or perception uh, lacks that credibility as we speak. So can you explain this case study with that in context in mind? Um, perhaps, perhaps let me uh, start by setting out my approach, the approach that uh, I started uh, with when I received the, the case study. Um, I had actually prepared responses to each and every uh, incident. In other words, in response to the, to the various uh, approaches by way of emails um, on the basis that I had just been appointed as National Director of Public Prosecutions. Um, I, I have made copies of those responses and if need be I can either now no, or you can share with us uh, at a later no stage. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> but just uh, yes. give us the pointers on the issues that yes. are raised in the case study with reference to the issue of fit and proper. Yes, well, the, 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 the first issue, and, and that, that for me was probably the most prominent one, um, the approach by one of the deputy national directors of public prosecutions in respect to a matter that he was seized with. 
um, that he was dealing with. And uh, the understanding was that, in fact, there has been no decision to prosecute that has been taken. The matter was still essentially under investigation. But then from a prosecution's point of view, that immediately raises the question, first of all, of the role of the prosecutor in carrying out the constitutional responsibilities <coughs> bestowed upon the National Prosecuting Authority by the Constitution, Section 179 of the Constitution. Pretty clear. It talks about the institution and conducting of criminal proceedings without fear or favor or prejudice. And then that is repeated once again in the National Prosecuting Act. Now the question perhaps may arise, <coughs> the matter appears to be at an investigation stage, so should prosecutors become involved in that? Well, it is clear that prosecutors are not investigators and in fact cannot be investigators. <coughs> but it's also clear that prosecutors have a duty and an obligation where they become aware of criminal conduct or where criminal conduct has been reported to them to make sure that that is investigated. In fact, there's a judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal in the uh, matter relating to the Zimbabwe torture which was brought by uh, the uh, litigation center where the court says the NPA has got a duty and an obligation to make sure that investigation takes place. And this happens by way of uh, instructing the police to investigate, guiding the investigation. And, 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 and that's where it all begins. So first of all, it's understanding the role and duty of a prosecutor. And you mentioned, uh, Chairperson, about perceptions of um, ineffectiveness, uh, perceptions of uh, 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 problems with the NPA. Uh, that is indeed so. But in my view, that happened because there was lack of understanding, first of all, of the constitutional role of the NPA, and secondly, of the responsibilities and functions of not only the NPA, but also the National Director of Public Prosecutions. Hey, Advocate Ramait, I know you are a LLD, <laughs> but let's get into the issue. Just demonstrate to us, uh, as a person who's ready there in the institution, on these issues that you have just raised. What's your role? My, 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 my role, first of all, is being the head of the institution, being the head of the National Prosecuting Authority, that is in terms of the Constitution as well as in terms of the law. And obviously that means taking responsibility not only for the performance of the functions of the NPA, but as well as the performance of the organization as a whole. The issues around planning, uh, the issues around performance management, the issues around financial management, and uh, as well as taking responsibility and accountability for the decisions that are taken by members of the, of the NPA. <coughs> and um, there are certain statutory obligations, for example, in terms of prevention of organized crime act, in terms of the um, um, prevention of corrupt activities act, uh, matters relating to terrorism, the NDPP is required to issue an authorization. And that is important because of the role that the NDPP uh, plays. So in, in brief, and that would be the, uh, at the apex of, of it all, the main role of the NDPP. Hey, AG. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Advocate Ramaita, um, you probably are like other candidates who already are in the institution for which you have made yourself available for this vacancy. Now, having gone through the ethics document of the NPA, I came across a number of values that uh, define or characterize the people in that institution. 
Among these values are accountability, credibility, integrity, uh, professionalism, and service excellence. Now, could you, for purposes and for the benefit of the panel, describe yourself uh, in the context of these values within the NPA, and also share some very real experiences where you were confronted by situations that required you to apply one or more of these values <coughs> within the context of the job that you are doing currently. Thank you. Let me focus mainly, first of all, on the issue of um, accountability. And perhaps in relation to all the values, because it begins with an understanding of what these values mean, okay, not only to the individual, but as well as to the, to the organization. And quite often one has this feeling that, and that's the difficult task that probably any NDPP can face, is to try and instill these values you know, throw out the whole of the NPA because it does not help that you have these values, let's say, in a very small section of the, of the NPA. But certainly there are ways that one can do that. The first is the value of accountability. <coughs> and, 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 and for me, um, and, and, and that has actually been my, my belief and credo, uh, first of all, as a, as a lawyer and as an officer of the court. Accountability to me, first of all, means being accountable to the rule of law in the sense that that means that as a prosecutor you are first, first and foremost accountable to the court. So in other words, you are an officer of the court and you cannot find yourself doing anything that will lead to the court criticizing you. That is the one thing that I have tried to avoid all my professional life as a public lawyer. And I will continue trying to avoid that. That's, that's in respect of accountability. And of course, there's also another level of accountability, that is accountability to Parliament. We, we have, in terms of the PFMA, in fact, as well as in terms of the, of the NPA Act, we have to account to Parliament. Uh, in terms of the PFMA Act, we have to account in respect of the budget, which... Uh, um, uh, if, if I may just interrupt you, Advocate Ramayita. If I may just repeat the, the, the descriptive words that are used, I wanted you to describe yourself in the context of these key values, as well as to share with us some very real experiences where you were confronted by situations within the NPA for the longest time um, that required you as advocate uh, Ramayite, to apply each one of these five or more of them. So it's got to be a descriptive situation that puts you at the center and mm -hmm. take us through those situations and how you prevailed over them in applying these values. That's really what we're looking for, not the definitional side of it. Thank you. I, I, I was trying to use the definitional side of it to try and demonstrate that this these are the values that I stand for. And, and these are the values that, 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 that I believe in. And, and to try and demonstrate my, my understanding and, and the fact that I internalize these values. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I, if I had missed uh, the, the, the question. When, in, in respect of the situations that um, uh, I found myself and having to overcome uh, uh, these, these, these values, and quite often that relates to, and, and I, I must be very careful here how, 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 how I deal with, with that. When it comes to decision making, um, I've, I've yeah. said, well, first of all, I believe that I'm accountable in respect of the rule of law as well as accountable to the court. There have been instances where <coughs> um, um, prosecutors have differed, and especially within senior leadership in terms of what decisions to take and based on what. And I have found myself in disagreement with that. And uh, I, 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 I have voiced and strongly defended my, my disagreement. 
and based on, on, on these values. I always said to colleagues when we disagreed, well, for me, it's a question of being accountable, it's a question of integrity, it's a question of being professional, it's a question of being, of being ethical. And that is, so, so in other words, my assessment has largely been value-based. And this, these are values that I live by, that I actually use to try and demonstrate my point of view and my argument. And um, if it had come to, and sometimes which has proved very difficult, to having to actually write that down and have it on record, uh, that's, that's what I've, I've, I've done. Uh, Mr. Scott. Thank you. <coughs> Advocate Maimani, I just want to, there's one of the values that um, came up in the Ginwala report. Yes. And it's a word which is quite long, but I'm sure you're familiar with it. The concept of conscientiousness. How do you interpret that word in terms of the office that you're now holding? and what is expected of you in terms of such a value. Thank you. Consciousness, um, it's, it's, and especially within, within, within um, one's understanding of your, your, your role as a, <coughs> as a prosecutor, sometimes as well as a lawyer, it's, it's a very broad word. It's very difficult to, to, uh, to describe. But then again, uh, for me, it goes back to the values, which are encapsulated, by the way, in our core values as the NPA, issues of accountability. So it's, it's, it's in a way what, what, what you regard as the fundamental values that you, that you have to, to have in mind, that you have to apply when you do certain things. And I, I emphasize the word do certain things because there is this tendency of thinking that, you know, prosecution is all about just prosecuting in court. It, it goes beyond that. So it's consciousness uh, in respect of a whole range of things that, uh, uh, you know, uh, prosecutors do. And again, without going into, into specifics. There are a number of examples that, 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 that one, one can give. How, how one, for example, tends to deal with potential conflict. And there are a number of conflicts that may arise um, in one's role as, as <coughs> an um, Economic influence, for example, you know, political influence. Now, it's, 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 it's about how one internalizes that in one's mind and applies that in arriving at a decision that for me is fair, just, and uh, in accordance with the, with the rule of law. But it's very, it's very there, there is no precise definition of, 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 of the word. Whether one has been conscientious, conscientious in one situation will, in my view, differ from situation to situation. I thought, uh, Advocate Ramait, with all these questions that are posed at you, if you can be more practical so that we understand what exactly you are saying. So, so I... Yeah, to demonstrate that uh, you've been in this institution uh, since 2000 and... Yeah. Even in Toy and Doi you were there. So yeah, yes. You okay. can be able to demonstrate these values that uh, we are asking you about so that we can come to the conclusion whether to recommend you as a fit and proper person to be appointed by the president. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very, well, I, I, I can try as best as I can, but, but it's very difficult. <coughs> as I said, there have been practical situations where um, I have differed uh, with some of my colleagues and I have used these values um, to demonstrate my, my point of view and, and, and my reason. Uh, Mr. Mathiesi. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> uh, Advocate uh, Ramayte, I would like us to be specific now, just to assist because of the questions that we asked. Have you read the 
judgment in the freedom under the law versus um, the NDPP, yes. the one that relates to general including. Did you read that judgment? Yes. Did you understand the serious levels upon which um, criticisms were leveled against the prosecutors that were involved in various stages of decision making in those cases? Yes, I do. Again, <coughs> did you read the case of uh, Corruption Watch versus uh, the President, the one that involved uh, the last DPP, Mr. Sean Abrams and Mr. Masak? Yes, I have. Judgment that are somewhere in that judgment, <coughs> make an assertion that the NPA currently there is an instability in that institution. Do you agree with that? Yes, I, 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 I agree. Then, if you agree with me, can you point us what are the areas of that instability? What is the instability that, in your own perception, would you point us that the instability is coming from this area and this area? <coughs> I, 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 I shall beg your indulgence, Chairperson, because I think some of these things one can explain historically since, since the establishment of the, of the NP. And again, and, and, and that's my view, I may be wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to be, con to, to be convinced. Um, it's a question of culture. Uh, you, should, you should remember that the NPA is now almost about 20 years. Um, and well, probably, you know, we've had almost four or so permanent, and which gives you an average of, let's say, five years within the development of the culture of the NPA. First of all, you have the office of the national director itself, which is a very, very high and responsible office. And be below that, you have, for example, the offices of the directors of public prosecution, you have the offices of the prosecutors. And the instability arises, and there has been instability, in fact, admittedly. So the instability arises in different cultures that obtain at various times in the life of the NPA. And I thought about it. Um, I, in fact, I intend to write about it at some point. That there seems to be different types of cultures over over the period. So you had the period of the first national director of public prosecutions. I mean, the culture there was kind of different because um, it was a time of, you know, starting and establishing the NPA, getting it to run, uh, figuring out things around the strategic plan, performance, and so on. And yeah, if I may interrupt, one of the problems uh, that I observe uh, if advocate you can bear with me. You are just putting yourself outside. You are a leader. You are a deputy director now. In fact, you are an acting. I'm asking you specifically, if you say you agree that there is an instability, what is the instability that is there now? It's just a simple question, not culture and all those things. But, no, no, I, I think, I think the, 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 the last instability, of course, came um, with the challenge of well, the, the removal, or shall I say, the, 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 the exit of Mr. Nassan, of course. I mean, that created instability um, because there was uncertainty in the organization. And then you then had the appointment of uh, Mr. Abrams. I mean, that also created instability. And what I'm trying to demonstrate is that comes with the culture that exists at any one point. Of which we are part. So, of which you are part. And, 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 and again there, uh, uh, if, if I may, uh, with, with respect, Chairperson, uh, the question perhaps is whether I ascribe to any, or the extent to which I ascribe to any. Majora. Thank you, Minister. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Amaite. And um, uh, may I also just welcome you to uh, 
to the interview. I, I've got just two or three simple <coughs> questions, and, and I, will, I will pose them and give you an, an opportunity to answer. Uh, th there seems to be um, uh, absence of teamwork within the, the, the National Prosecuting Authority. Now, if you were the chosen candidate, the selected candidate, how would you mold it into one team? I mean, with, with all the years that we've spent there, you probably now know what causes it. How would you then mold it into a team and a force that um, um, would bring back public confidence in, in, in the institution? Um, thank you, Chairperson. For me, the best way of molding a team is, first of all, getting the people who matter involved. And that starts right at the top. And you, 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 one needs to build trust. And I have throughout um, uh, endeavored at all times to build trust, even, even, even during difficult times, uh, even sometimes during uh, infighting. Um, I have always seen myself as one who tried to build um, um, uh, teamwork. And obviously, at the top level, you, you, you need to have the confidence and the trust of the Deputy National Directors of Public Prosecutions. But one must bear in mind that their level is at, in essence, head of his level. What is significant... How do you create that trust? It's to involve uh, everybody, to involve the leadership, the leadership. So in other words, you have four deputies. It cannot be that at times you... You know, you only trust or have confidence in two of your deputies. So you, you need to have confidence in all of them to bring them. But you are right now, you are the National Director of Public Prosecutions since August. What, is, what have you done since then to answer this question from Mr. Machol? I, 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 I have constantly involved everyone who is, who, who, who is at leadership level. Um, and, and, and in particular, the directors of public prosecutions who are leaders in their own provinces. I mean, I constantly engage with them. In fact, I have made it known to them that there will be instances where I will rely heavily on them. You, you have a strategy for dealing with this? Yes. Okay. Now, um, there was a, the issue of the case of uh, General Mkhuli. Yes. And I just wanted to know According to you, what should be the ideal relationship between the National Prosecuting Authority, led by the National Director of Public Prosecutions, and the investigators, as well as the SAPS in general? There should be a very, very close working relationship. I mean, historically, there has been this distant relationship. But I was responsible, amongst others, uh, for the nation. Is it not that there has been a very close relationship that doesn't give the independence to the NPA to say there is a case against you, and therefore we are going to do what the Constitution requires us as the, uh, as the NPA to do, but rather to go round in circles? Isn't the relationship too close? No, no, it depends. It depends on the, on, on, on the type of matters or crimes that you're dealing with. For example, in general crimes, which takes place in almost 80 to 90 percent of the matters that we deal with, that, that, that distance actually still, still exists. But it matters most when it's authority that we've got to deal with, because it's easier to deal with the ordinary low, low, low level people. But when justice is seen to be done, it's when the National uh, Prosecuting Authority treats everybody the same, you know, and say, also, we're going to prosecute you irrespective of whether you're the commissioner of police or you are a constable in the police force or you are one of our, of our own, you are one of the prosecutors, we're going to deal with you in the same way. That's, that's, that's correct, but um, in practice, uh, that's the life of a prosecutor. It's very difficult. 
Um, I think you probably would be familiar with the difficulties in, um, uh, in, in prosecution of international crime, where you have all sorts of different interests. So, so you, are, you, you are right, I agree with you. Uh, but then uh, one must be conscious of the challenges and, and, and at least know how to deal with them. In other words, cases like the Mkhuli may reappear. No, well, not, 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 not under my watch. Advocate Tessilia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Ramiti. I'm a bit concerned with your answers. Uh, I would appreciate it if you uh, answer in more practical terms. Uh, it seems to me you agree that at present the NPA is in a crisis. Would you agree with that? As we speak now, um, no, not, 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 not as we speak now. And that's why I tried to, to, to kind of, <clears throat> at the time, at the time that I was asked to, to act, there was, there was certainly, there was certainly um, a big challenge. Uh, and especially, especially at head office level. But then if you look at what is currently happening now, and especially in the offices of the directors of public prosecutions, there's, there's been a lot of improvement in terms of the work that is currently being done. Are you there is a request that uh, panelists, when they speak, they must speak over to the mic so that they are audible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So are you saying at this stage, and is the message that you as the acting NDPP sends out that there's no concern for the public and for the president relating to the office of the uh, NPA? As far as I, as far as um, I, I, am, I am aware, that there, is, that there shouldn't be any, any concern. You did say that Previously, before you uh, took up the acting position, there were challenges. What, what do you see? What were the problems at that stage? Well, the, 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 the problems were getting back to work, and especially in respect of some of the cases that were already running, and just getting those cases uh, start running. Are you saying it was only a delay problem? It was not a delay. It was not a delay problem really, because some of those cases had actually stopped. Do you see any problems uh, relating to the relationships within the NPA between colleagues, between the various uh, prosecutors? Uh, are you aware of any? problems that they have interrelationships between the, the prosecuting authority staff? At, at the moment, I'm not aware of any, of any such, and not, neither have such been brought to my attention. The uh, chairperson asked you a question relating to the case study, and with respect, I, I would have expected you to provide in your answer to give a more specific, practical answer to that question. Uh, with respect, my view is that you haven't answered the question yet, and it's an extremely important question as far as I'm concerned. The case study relates to a specific problem that a new NDPP was confronted with. Do you agree with me? That's the, the case yes, study. Yes. Okay. I haven't heard you Telling the chairperson uh, on a specific question in that regard, what would your approach have been under those circumstances, specifically set out in some detail in the case study? The, 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 well, the communications uh, contain different contents. But it does go to the heart of the problems yes, that an NDPP will be confronted yes. with in his job. Yes, it does. And, and the one I tried to demonstrate by the, well, the, the, the approach 
or the communication to the new NDPP from the Deputy National Director responsible for prosecutions <coughs> and informing the National Director about uh, a matter that he was currently seized with. Um, and I, I don't know whether it would convenient at a later stage to, to provide the members with, uh, with copies. My approach, in fact, has been to state... We to thought you can, you can give us the copies. Okay. Um, to, 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 to indicate the approach that one, that, that one would have to take. I mean, the, the first thing to, to remember is that if the matter is still at an investigation stage, well, the prosecutor does not have investigative power, but the prosecutor does have, well, the obligation and <coughs> duty to request um, an investigation. And I set out clearly Obviously, needs to be a balance between you know, national security and public interest. But one must always remember the prosecutor is to institute in terms of the constitution criminal proceedings. And of course, um, there are ways in which that is done. You have to do an assessment of the, of, of the evidence and so on. And there's a question of the public interest. And the tricky question here, and, 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 and this is a practical problem, it has happened in the UK. The, the linkage between the public interest and the national interest or national security. I mean, we have a judgment of the House of Lords, where in fact the House of Lords seems to suggest that the national interest trumps, you know, the public interest. But again, I try to demonstrate there that there are those issues that one will have to deal with. Let's, let's come back to terma ferma, no, not UK. Answer the specific question. Dr. Amiti, I would like to know, would you have proceeded with the prosecution and or the further investigation of this case or not? I, 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 would, have, I would have proceeded with the further investigation. And how would you have dealt with the attempted interference from... from various senior uh, government officials. The, 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 the best way to deal with these things is always to refer back to the Constitution because that's the guiding principle. There is a provision in the Constitution that obliges all institutions of government to work together and to try and resolve their problems before resorting to litigation. Just one last issue, uh, Dr. Amiti. Were you in time for your uh, interview this morning? Sorry? Were you late this morning? Well, I was given to understand that the interview would start at half past ten, uh, but I was here uh, at quarter to, quarter to ten. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sigogo. Thank you. Dr. Ramayte, I understand you are in SC. I saw in the in the curriculum today. So um, there are two issues. The first one, um, which I'd like to find out with you, do you have a security clearance? Yes, I do. To, to prosecute. Yes, it's a top secret security clearance. Okay, I'm asking this because um, before me it shows as if it is pending. So I think that will be then covered. Um, the, the issue that I, I would want to understand uh, with you is that we do not want NDPP who can be controlled from outside by, by any force. So do you have things which could compromise you and the NPA which can be used against you 
in order to sway your decisions? I'm not aware of anything that can or is likely to compromise me in the exercise of my functions and the execution of my duties. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Advocate Manya. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Dr. Ramayya, you have been with the, um, the National Director of Public Prosecution for very long time, correct? Yes, um, I, I, yeah, I, I spent most of my professional career um, you know, in the criminal justice system, let me put it in that way. All right. And um, sometimes it was not by choice, it was by just that. No, no, that's, that's fine. My, my question has been answered. And you have been in the position of the Deputy National Director of Public Prosecution for more than 50 years. Yes. Close to 15 years, correct? Yeah, I, I, I'm not so sure about how, how that is calculated, but what, what, what I can say is um, I, I started as a director of public prosecutions uh, for Pretoria, and then I became a special director of public prosecutions in the office of the first national director of public prosecution, mainly responsible for crafting new ways of dealing with crime, the specialized units. And then after the establishment of those units, I was then appointed Deputy National Director of Public Prosecutions, responsible for those units. That was the Specialized Commercial Crimes Unit, the Priority Crimes Litigation Unit, and the Sexual Offenses Community Affairs Unit, and subsequently the Office for Witness Protection. Thank and you, Dr. Ramak. Can, can, can I just interrupt you for a second? Uh, I, I think I did pose a very yeah, uh, okay. straight That's question yeah. that, that no, needs okay. too much elaboration on it. And once you have answered the question, please, you know, okay. allow for the questions to follow. You acted in the uh, position of Acting National Director of Public Prosecution 2004 to 2005, mm -hmm. 2015 again, and to date you're still acting from August. You have had numerous stints of acting in that position. Right. So basically, as the other panel members have asked you questions relating to the inner workings of the uh, National Director of Public Prosecution, and for us to understand exactly what was happening and why is that office in the state that it is today, you have been almost central to that. You have been there all the time, correct? It might not have been your decisions no, that no, no, went yes. the other way, but you have been no, in the true. middle of the whole thing. Okay, all right. And you have not answered some of the questions and more important questions that came from some of the panel members here in relation to the inner workings of the office of the uh, National Director of Public Prosecution. Let me ask you this question. And that task was then left to, to, to the court uh, in numerous judgments. Let me ask you this question. When, when the court uh, declares that the National Director of Public Prosecution and DPPs have not demonstrated exemplary devotion to the independence of their office or expected capacity to pursue certain matters with without fear or favor. What would be your response to that? Well, I, I, I agree with the judgment. I've, I've got no reason to disagree with the judgment. All right. If you do not disagree, the, your answers to the questions <coughs> that what was the root cause of the chaos that we have in the office of the NDPP, you did not say anything about uh, uh, that you simply said, well, these are structural and cultural problems that we have. The instability is caused by certain things rather than decision-making process by certain individuals that are tasked with those decision-making process within the office of the NDPP. What do you have to say to that? I, I, what I've been trying to explain, and, 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 and I, I would implore this panel to, to, to actually understand it from that viewpoint. 
the major cause, in fact, first of all, is the culture that you find in the NP. And, and if you'll allow me, Chairperson, let me try to, to, to expand a little bit. Because what you have is you have the culture in the office of the NTPP, all right, and the culture in the office of the TPP. Now, if that is not underpinned by belief in constitutional values, belief in the rule of law, you are likely to have those problems, those challenges. Mr. Mr. Ramit, let me just interject. The, uh, you, you keep on talking about culture uh, in the NTPP. What, what culture are you talking about? What, what, what exactly are you talking about? Are you talking about something else outside of the policies of the NDPP that guides the officials of the... What are you talking about? It's, it's, well, it's, it, that's, that's, that's part of it. But one must remember that, first of all, the NPA, the NDPP, the role of prosecutors, is first of all underpinned by independence. And, and that is part of the constitution. That's a constitutional value. But the culture seems to be interfering all the time. Well, it's... Oh, sorry, I'm... I'm, I'm sorry. The problem, advocate, we are not answering questions directly. That's, that's the frustration that this panel is having. You are being asked direct questions. You are very philosophical. You tell us about the House of Lords. And when we're here in South Africa, we want to know what's happening at the NPA. What's your role if you are appointed as the national director? But I have not had you on these matters. Well, f first of for all, for example, Edward Mani says, 2015, you were acting national director of public prosecution. I would have expected you to say during the time that I was acting, these are the decisions that I took or I couldn't take this decision because of X, Y, Z. You know, that, truth be told, uh, um, that's exactly what we're looking for. Yes, no, 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 no. <laughs> Maybe, let me answer directly. Truth be told, and I, I've tried to say that the, the, the last thing that I always want to avoid is having to find, um, uh, you know, courts and your name appearing in the judgment where the judge actually you know, directly, directly uh, uh, finds fault with you. And I'm not, there isn't any, any judgment. And, uh, and especially during, during, during the period that I acted. I, I appreciate that fact, but we're talking about the, we're not talking about an individual here. We understand that you cannot be, we are not expected, the public doesn't expect you to be a one-man army. You're not Rambo, okay? Now, Rambo is only in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> Look, what, what, what we want to find out, and let me just go straight to the, to, to, to the question, really, because you have not been answering a lot of questions that have been posed to you by the panel. According to your knowledge, has there been any interference with the decision-making of certain officials in relation to certain cases that were supposed to be prosecuted or not? Not, not that I am personally aware of. Now, so your answer is no. Well, from from my point of view, no, I haven't. I haven't. So, in other words, you have not been captured. You have not been interfered with. I personally, okay. no. All right, maybe others. <laughs> well, I don't know what you're saying. Well, I don't know. I, I cannot say much about others. Uh, but you've been in this institution for so many years. Mm. You should be knowing, unless you. You see nothing, you hear nothing. <laughs> Jefferson, I, I, you, I think you probably would know. Uh, <laughs> your, uh, I'm not applying to be the NDPP. Yes. That's why you are sitting there. <laughs> no, but I'm saying I, 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 I have, well, I, you seem to be hesitant in answering questions. Sometimes you use the word, I have to be cautious, which creates the impression that, you know, decision-making, we are not decisive. Yeah. But Mr. Ramit, you are a member of this um, society, community. You are a citizen of this country. Yes. You have taken oath of this office of the Public Housing Authority, correct? Mm -hmm. All right. And your oath of office, when you took it as an advocate, I'll read it back to you. It says that you swear that you will be truly and honestly demean yourself in the practice of advocate according to the best of your knowledge and ability. And further, that you will be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. Yes. Now, what the court 
I have said in numerous judgments, including the one for freedom under the law, you would accept that that was a serious indictment to the, to the Office of the National Director of Public Prosecutions. Yes, to the Office of the National Director of Public Prosecutions. If you take the oath, I would take that to be, and I stand to be corrected, to be in two parts. First, you say that you will truly and honestly demean yourself in the practice of an advocate, correct? Further, that according to your best knowledge and ability, and further, that you'll be <coughs> faithful to the Republic of South Africa. That's the oath. Uh, does it come with expiry date? When, yeah. When do you ever stop being faithful to the Republic? Well, uh, look, I mean, once, when, once. Once, and that was my understanding, once I took the oath, and as long as I had remained an advocate and in relation to you know, the NPA, as long as I remained, I have to be always faithful and truthful to that oath. So it comes with expiry date, terminating date, that once you cease being an advocate, you are no longer faithful. Can you sign up to the advocate? That is the impression I created, I'm sorry. You, you, you always have to, you know, I mean, um, it may very well be that you're not in a practice, but as long as you remain a member of that profession, you have to, or part of that profession, you always have to be faithful to it. Now, you said something about certain instances where you disagreed with certain officials within the office of the NDPB when coming to certain decisions that were made, correct? Yes. All right. Now, you say, said that um, where you disagreed, you were overruled, or you were ignored. Well, I will yeah. Let me say that my view was just not accepted. All right. And if you were true to your view, and you held it so firmly that you believed that you were correct, what did you do? you advance that belief to anyone else above you? Um, well, what could you do as well? What did you do? What could you do? Yeah, look, you, you know, in, in actually in most of those instances, I have warned that uh, we are likely to have uh, judgments against us. I'm asking specifically when you were overruled or were you ignored, your views were ignored during the process of decision making on a specific matter, what steps did you take? I Any? didn't, I didn't uh, do anything, any, anything further. I, I, I accepted um, the other view, despite, I mean, I, I, I agreed to disagree. I simply agreed to disagree. And that led to the chaos that we have now in the office of the NDPP, that people that held a firm view and believe that things were not going right or decisions Incorrect decisions were uh, taken based on considerations that should not have been considered. You did nothing about that. No, I, I mean there, there was there was little that I could do within the confines of my role as a as a deputy national director. Nothing further. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, sir. The last we're winding up now. The AG wanted to raise one question. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just coming back as a final shot on my side, um, um, Advocate Ramarita, the, 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 the reality is that uh, you have deprived us of getting insights from you in the real world of work. Um, and I guess maybe what we can try and do now is to figure out, considering that you've applied for this NDPP position, have you got any fresh ideas that could come into this environment to lift it from where it is. Thank you, Peach. The, the, the ideas are not fresh at all because they are there ingrained, first of all, in the Constitution, and I want to emphasize that. And it's simply having to be truthful to the Constitution, doing what the Constitution requires. The ideas are already there. 
for example, in the rule of law, in the principle of legality. So for me, for me, and and and, and that's the sort of culture that I'm trying to to say. So you're talking about the rule of, I mean, the culture, the culture of being faithful to the constitution, the culture of being faithful to the rule of law. That's 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 your guide. The culture of of, of legality, um, the culture of, <coughs> of prosecutorial independence, and the majority of the prosecutors are actually living up to that. It's just to really now make sure and and refocus refocus the organisation to actually go back to those values because those 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 are the values and 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 and, and the things that we started with when the NPA started, but they got lost along. Last question from my side. Do you have any previous convictions? No, I don't. Do you want to ask us any question? Uh, I would have loved to, but uh, maybe, 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 well, maybe some other time, not now. <laughs> Are you sure about that? Well, um, yeah, I don't know. You, you never know when opportunity may come not again. No thanks, Advocate Ramaita. At the end of the process, uh, you'll be informed via the presidency the outcome of this interview. Thank you, Chairperson. Can I can I request uh, yes, please to uh, Chair? There are there are I think nine nine copies here. Uh, Good, appropriate. Thank you. Next candidate ready, Advocate Mapoma.
Good morning, Advocate Mapoma. Good morning, Prime Minister. Welcome to this interview. Thank you. I have with me here on my right uh, the Auditor General, Makwetu, Scott Nochesi, Majol on my left, Advocate Celia, Sikoko, and Advocate Mayu. You were nominated and accepted the nomination and applied for the position of National Director of Public Prosecutions. Yes, Mr. President. So we're having an interview with you now. Yes. You've been practicing as an advocate since 2012? Yes, in private practice since 2012. And previous to that, uh, you were General Manager at Transnet 2008-2012? Yes, sir as well as acting CEO of Autopex from 2008 to 2009. Yes, sir. And then as a legal advisor to Transnet, 2007 to 2008. Yes. And you also worked as, as an evaluator of Eastern and Southern Africa Ottomani. What's that? It's a, it's a, it was an, an uh, initiative for the, by the FATF at the time when the Financial Action Task Force uh, wanted Africa to participate uh, in its programs. So they started what was called the Eastern and Southern Africa anti Laundering Group. Okay. So South Africa at the time uh, was applied to become a member of the FATF. Okay. Yes, and uh, it was a program that right. took us right. there. And uh, in your practice since 2012, what is the nature of your practice as an advocate? I deal with uh, normal civil litigation. Uh, I get briefs uh, from, from attorneys uh, as, as an advocate in private practice. So I'm doing civil litigation. Uh, I do um, focus mainly on administrative law and the general civil litigation, and I do commercial law as well. I have uh, some matters that I do on, on criminal law, but they're not many. Okay. But I do practice criminal law as well. Okay. We are aware that we gave you an assignment in terms of the case study. Yes. Yeah. So I'd like to ask you to explain that case study very briefly, but within the context of our Constitution, the NPA Act, the Code of Conduct, and the various jud judgments of the Constitutional Court in particular, on your candidature as a fit and proper person to be appointed as a NDPP, your practice in our courts, your experience, your conscientiousness, integrity, as well as uh, the basic principle that when you act as an NDPP, you should do so without fear, favor, or prejudice. So, but take into account the case study that uh, we have given you so that you can demonstrate to us that you are a fit and proper person to be recommended as the NDPP. Thank you, Jim. Um, the way I determined uh, the case study was that as the NDPP, you have got various interests uh, that need you to support their cause. People uh, will bring various cases to you and you, you have to give them um, how you view the matter and your independence must be clear. You have uh, requests, for instance, in the case study for, from the minister, from, from the DG, from uh, your colleagues, who are your subordinates, and from the president, who are all asking about uh, a particular suspicion about a particular individual that they have. In my view, there is no evidence that was presented to the NTPP about the exact nature of the offenses that were alleged. However, there is a suspicion that uh, the said Mr. Ivanov was interested in the armaments program of the country. And uh, the interactions uh, that were alleged to have occurred, occurred outside the country. And uh, the two statutes that I consider to be relevant in this matter was the State Intelligence Act and uh, the, if I can just refer to my notes, the National Conventional Arms Control Act. Both these acts um, allow for extraterritorial jurisdiction. That is, if crimes are committed outside the country, they can be deemed to have been committed inside the country. However, the people who must be prosecuted in terms thereof, in terms of these acts, it must be South African citizen, 
must be domiciled within the country or must have permanent residence in the country. So this Mr. Ivanov, uh, according to the facts that we have, there is no indication that he committed any crime inside the country. So I will need evidence that the crimes were committed inside the country in respect of him. But any other person who has sold classified information to him, where there's evidence of that nature, would have, would have to be prosecuted. Because even if they met Mr. Ivanov in Moscow, these two statutes will deem that they committed these acts inside. So I've, uh, in my response uh, to, to the GNTPP, Mr. Nguanya, who sent the uh, complaint to me, I've asked him for specifics. Because before you deal with the problem, you need to understand the facts. As a lawyer, you need to understand the facts. People cannot send you rumors and, and then ask you to make decisions based on rumors because we apply a lot to the facts as lawyers. So I've asked him um, to, to give me specifics uh, so that I know what to do. Secondly, I've asked him uh, under what authority is he saying he's investigating the matter because he's sitting at the, at the NPA's office and he claims to be the one who's doing the investigating. So I wanted to know from him uh, what is the role of the other members in the cluster. Uh, the SAPS, for instance, which uh, under normal circumstances will be the one doing the investigation. Also, if this is a matter that involves the intelligence services, they will be, if you want to, to call it, a victim in this instance. So as a victim, uh, we will want to know if any of their laws have been contravened. Uh, and all those things uh, must, must be investigated. Also, we need to, to know what evidence is there. Because before you take a decision to prosecute, you, you need to evaluate the evidence that is before you. Is the evidence reliable? Uh, 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 have any witnesses made any statements? You know, are, are those statements, uh, are, are these witnesses still available to testify? Is the evidence credible? Is it reliable? Is it admissible? Are these witnesses compatible, for instance? Even if you have uh, statements that are there, and when you evaluate, you realize that the matter will never be taken to court, or will never succeed when it's court, because the evidence is no longer now available. So you cannot take that kind of matter to court because your reasonable prospects of successful prosecution uh, are not there. So for us, uh, to make any determination of a prosecution, we need to know what evidence we have. Um, Mr. Nguenya also um, uh, uh, indicates that uh, he had, there is no, uh, the, the information that he received is not quite clear. So that on its own uh, uh, makes us to understand that it is, we do not have facts sufficient enough to prosecute. And then there is a, a request from, from the DG uh, who also raises the issue of Mr. Ivanov. And then in his uh, letter he communicates, he says, uh, if you prosecute Mr. Ivanov, this might uh, take uh, quite, uh, it, it, it will have financial implications for the NPA and this might have a bad audit outcome for the NPA and he's concerned about that. And uh, in my reply to him, I informed him that uh, the bad audit out outcome uh, is not a factor uh, that the prosecutor must take when deciding to prosecute a matter. Uh, it's, it's simply not. Similarly, uh, with the president. The president also informs me that uh, he has a national program uh, to go and get investment uh, around uh, the world and in particular he is interested uh, in Russia. So he is saying that uh, he wants uh, uh, me to take proper decisions around how we deal with Mr. Ivanov. And uh, I also replied to the president to say that uh, the NPA policies uh, do not allow that uh, when you take a decision to prosecute, you must look at uh, the national economic interest. You must look at the particular individual uh, that you're dealing with, or you must look at uh, our relationship, our relations with South Africa, uh, with another country. In this instance, his interest uh, in Russia. So these decisions uh, to prosecute cannot be affected by that. Because if we, we, we allow that kind of, of, of uh, thing to happen. It will mean that you first have to, you have to calculate now how much a particular decision will cost before you take it. And that will be a slippery slope uh, into a, a hole that the NPA will never come out of. There is a, 
Also, uh, a letter from uh, Mr. Koza, who is at the State Security Agency. Mr. Koza says that is very hostile uh, because he deems uh, the, the alleged investigation uh, to be interference uh, with, uh, with, his, with his area of work uh, in the cluster. And uh, the first thing that one needs to do in this instance is to, is to diffuse the situation because the hostility that Mr. Koza shows uh, is, is not warranted. But you will not want to be dismissive of his concern, but you will want to indicate to him uh, that uh, we will investigate, I mean, sorry, we will prosecute if evidence comes to the fore that a crime has been committed. And we, we, we say that unequivocally. Um, the NPA Act, I, I think it's uh, Section 32, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, provides that we will take our decisions uh, according to the Constitution and to the law. And uh, no organ of state, no person will be allowed or shall be allowed by the law to interfere with any procedural, procedural decision. So Mr. Koza's threat to take the NP to court, uh, uh, threats that uh, another here or there, we will take the matter to court if there's evidence. I also advised him as well that um, there are ways and means to resolve disputes between government entities, uh, one of them being the Intergovernmental Relations Framework Act uh, that allows for, for government institutions to resolve their disputes, if any. There, there's, no, excuse me, there's no need um, for, for him to, to take the matter to court to indict the NPA from, from prosecuting. But if he did so, if he takes the NPA to court uh, for that, then we'll deal with the matter at that, at that stage. Another thing is that I, I, I informed Mr. Koza that uh, in the criminal justice cluster, there are also other players that are involved, uh, the, the police, for instance, uh, who are critical in any investigations and any matters that are taken to court by the NPA. So the N police's um, <clears throat> update on the matter is still required because we do not have all the facts. What I have in front of me are, are mere allegations. So I need to find out from the police if there's any investigation that uh, they, are, they are doing on the matter, to get an update, where are we with the, with the evidence, and whether any decision will be taken to prosecute. Another person who has raised uh, this issue is, uh, uh, I think, Bridget Smith. Bridget Smith, uh, it's, it's said on the, on the case study that she also uh, is advising against any prosecution uh, against Mr. Ivanov for the same reason that uh, he told to uh, interfere with, uh, with the policies. But she doesn't mention which policies are those. Uh, and I ask her specifically to indicate to me, again, on the basis of getting all the facts before you act, which policies is the same will be contravened. Because as far as I understand the policies of the NPA, um, they do not um, allow a situation where you do not prosecute because of economic considerations. But there might be, uh, because I'm new in the position, some, some policies that I might not be aware of. Uh, so I, I need to understand from, from, from here. I've also invited both um, U, U, Mr. Nguenya and, and Smith to come to me, because I understand that they've had an altercation. Uh, and as senior members of the organization, uh, this cannot be allowed. And uh, I understand that Smith also is acting on, on, on is saying that uh, she had things uh, along the corridors. So no, I think uh, I have, have heard you. I'll right. allow my colleagues to answer the AG. To, sorry to ask the AG. <clears throat> thank you very much, Chair. And uh, once again, thank you, uh, Advocate uh, Maboma. Um, I'm going to deal with the issue of the values of the National Prosecution Authority. I know you are not there, but I'm sure the issues that are going to need your insight are known to you. You've been there before, and I'm sure in preparation for this session, you also would have checked some of those in terms of the code of ethics and stuff. And they are clearly listed in the, in the document of the NPA, and these five values are the value of accountability, credibility, integrity, 
professionalism and service excellence. All five of them are set out as some of the defining foundational elements of uh, what this prosecution service is about. Now, keeping that in mind, um, and of course not necessarily within the NPA role, but even in your current role where you are now, could you describe yourself as Advocate Mapoma, thinking about these five values as being critical to this role, and share with us the very real experiences where you confronted uh, situations that required you to apply any combination of these values. If you could just try and make it more practical for us so that you also <laughs> give us your insights uh, using the first person. Thanks. You, you, you want me to give you examples about uh, where I experienced or where I encountered a uh, situation where the values or some of the values had to be applied? Yes, and how you apply them generally in situations of your professional uh, journey, okay. including when you were at some point within this institution. Thank you. The values that, uh, the five values that you referred to uh, are part of the mission statement of the NPA. And if you look at the, at the code of conduct, the current one, I, I think it was uh, finalized in 2013 when I looked. It's a similar code of conduct to private practice. The requirements are the same, basically the same. And most importantly, um, it's about integrity, professionalism, as you say, service excellence, credibility, and so on. Now, in my life uh, in the courts, uh, there are many instances where one has had to apply these things. Uh, I, I'm struggling to, to think of an instance that would uh, 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 be applicable to all of them. But you, you as, as a professional now at the bar, there are certain rules of ethics uh, that you abide by. They're not different from the requirements of, to prostitutes in civil service. You, I've not had instances, for instance, where uh, I've had to, to to stray away from my values. To me, the values are very simple to understand. If, if, if you live by them and there's a situation that requires you, you know, to apply them, you simply do that. And, and I honestly am struggling to think of a situation where I had to, you know, really have to think about how to apply these things because they're second nature to me. They're second nature to me um, since I started prostituting, since I've, I've always been in the courtrooms, I've, I've never had situations where I've, I've have had to be disciplined, for instance, where I've had to make um, a decision to, between this and this and this other instance. Because to me, these are simple things to understand. I, I struggle when I, 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 I see colleagues who don't understand it. But for me personally, I've, I've, had never, I've not had a situation where I've struggled whether to apply a certain value or not. Maybe I don't understand the question, but I don't have an instance that I can think of that comes to mind where I have had to specify the thing that now I'm applying this particular value or not. No, that's fine. We didn't want you to do it in that mechanical way, but uh, maybe now that you've appreciated the importance of this, in your role as National Director of Public Prosecutions, how would you go about promoting these same values in the institution and among the people that make up this institution. Perhaps okay. deal with that part then. No, thank you. No, that's much better for me. When you go to the courts uh, currently, you will see a number of situations which are not ideal. For instance, you will get to court and the um, court doesn't start on time. Um, you'll get to court and, and there's no one in court. You, you'll get to court, you'll find the prosecutor uh, coming in absolutely not prepared. You'll get to court and uh, you see my being postponed for no reason at all. There's no explanation to the litigants, the victim or the accused. 
there's no expression to you as a colleague. You will get to court and you see the dress code you know, of the person. You, you'll get there, you see people living uh, early, uh, where it's a norm that uh, it's a Friday, it's month end, people must leave early, that kind of thing. You will see that there's lack of preparation, uh, there's no consultation with the witnesses and so on. So in my interactions, I see this kind of things happening all the time. So the first thing that one needs to do, this code of conduct uh, that we talk about, one gets the sense that some of the procedures are not aware or even some of the staff in the NPA are not aware of the Code of Conduct. The NPA Act requires uh, an oath to be taken, for instance, uh, by the prosecutor, so that they are aware of what is required of them. So when you uh, get to, to be an NPA head, one of the things that you do is to inspire people to understand the mission and to practice it, uh, the, 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 the values that are here. You must remind them of them, where they've forgotten them. Professionalism, for instance, for those who are advocates, those who are prosecutors, is, is very, very important. How they treat uh, accused persons, how they treat victims, how they treat witnesses who are in court. Sometimes you get uh, a sense that prosecutors would uh, not want you as a defense counsel to, to know that uh, there are this information that will be beneficial to your client, which is not something that is not professional. Um, sometimes, uh, you, you, what we want to do is, 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 to, is to revive the knowledge, revise the knowledge. Because people know this thing, but it has just not been practiced. One of the most important things is to take the lead in this. If you as a leader, you walk the talk, uh, people will see this thing happening with you. There are things, for instance, these days called casual Fridays, which are turning to casual Mondays and casual Wednesdays and things like that. Because you, you see the system slowly slipping away because you allowed a particular situation to start. So the values are there. One simply has to remind uh, the employees of these values. I don't think it's going to be a difficult thing to do because people take the lead from the top. And if the top shows that people must be on time when they go to work, the hours uh, of work are, are there. Uh, the reporting lines are clear. People are not reporting on time, perhaps. There are reports, for instance, that the NPA must make uh, uh, to Parliament, and those reports will not be made on time if the reports are not coming on time from the various courts, from the various TPPs, and so on. There are disciplinary issues uh, 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 in general where disciplinary meters will drag for, for months on end, and you do not want situations like that. People must be dealt with. Uh, if uh, an employee is guilty, he's guilty. If not guilty, he's not guilty. We don't want situations where people are sitting there not knowing where they stand in the organization. They are under a cloud for long periods of time. These are things that you don't want. So professionalism, integrity, service excellence, uh, credibility are all things that each individual member must do for the organization itself to do. It, it becomes easy if the individual member uh, knows what to do each individual member knows what to do, then the NPA as an organization will then know what to do. And I think that it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the leader yeah, that, must, that must show that, that must walk the talk. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Chair. Advocates, a former. I've just looked at your CV and maybe you can just clarify one or two things for me. Um, at present, you are in private practice from the 3rd of December 2012 to date, is that correct? Yes. And um, your experience, if I may call it this, in the National Prosecuting Authority was more particularly, firstly, in terms of the state, as a state advocate in the Specialized Commercial Crimes Court? No, it starts earlier than that. And, uh, and then on from that, as Deputy Director, Directorate of Special Operations, National Prosecuting Authority. Yes, from the SCU, that's where I went. And that's from 2002 <coughs> through to January 2007, is that correct? Yes. And thereafter, you have not actually, you then went to the bar, or you... After, after, after the TSO, I went to Transnet. Yes, you went to Transnet, and then you're presently at the bar, but you are no longer involved in the National Prosecuting Authority. No. 
Um, so your experience in the prosec National Prosecuting Authority, if one had to look at your actual CV, is dealing with those specific aspects or departments if it, or directorates that you were involved in at that time, from uh, 2002 through to 2007. Is that correct? No, it doesn't. That's not correct. Maybe you can just. I'm just trying to establish a time frame. Yes. Here when you were part of the National Prosecuting Authority in the Directorate of Special Operations? Well, let me start where it starts. I started in 1989 in the Prosecuting Authority, and then uh, at some stage I became a magistrate, and then from the, from the bench in the District Court in 1996, I was appointed as a senior state advocate at the then WLT which was the Strand Local Division. And then um, from the WLD, uh, I left uh, to, to private practice at the sidebar. And then at the sidebar, uh, I then came back to the NPA in 2001 and then joined the SCCU. But before that, there was a program that the NPA had, which was run by Advocate Henning, a uh, training program of, of, to train prosecutors around the country. I was part of that program. And then I went to the SCCU. Then from the SCCU, I went to head office, the TSO head office uh, in Pretoria, where I was heading one of the desks there. And then from there, I went to the TSO, to head the TSO office in East London. And then from that office in East London, I then went to Transnet. Thank you. One of the issues that you raised uh, to the AG just now, was the lack of service excellence, as I think you actually dealt with. If you were the National Director of Public Prosecutions, how would you, if you had an opportunity, an unfettered opportunity to do something that you believe could actually improve the functioning of the courts in this country, what would you see as a priority, bearing in mind what you've just told this panel now? I think the issue of the vacancies must be addressed uh, very, very quickly. Uh, I believe there are vacancies that need to be filled at all, at all levels. Secondly, is uh, the issue of training of prosecutors. Uh, even if you fast track those that have to be fast tracked, but they need to be properly trained, you see now we have a, a different kind of criminal. Uh, you have a, a criminal with resources. Who, who, who are very brazen, who have resources to get lawyers, cyber crime and so on. So there are different types of crime than where 20 years ago. So we need to train prosecutors to be able to deal with that. And we need to resource them properly. Sometimes a, a prosecutor will sit there in, in the one court and everything is expected of that prosecutor, despite the challenges. It's one prosecutor, it's one court, everything must be done by him or her bail applications, uh, trials, all those things. He still must consult with witnesses and do all sorts of things. So I think the NPA needs to be resourced properly to, to cater for the type of crime that we have and also to cater for the wave of criminal criminality that we currently have in the country. Uh, if one you look at the, the backlogs uh, that we have, uh, the number of cases that are in the backlog, uh, the cause of that, one of the causes of that is that we do not have enough prosecutors. And you might have prosecutors, but we still need we still need the department to find a way to build more courtrooms. And we should not shy away from that. And for instance, in Umtata, uh, where I come from, there's a court building that, that was built in 1975 or somewhere there. When Umtata was small at the time, now Umtata has grown, the population has grown. Uh, that courtroom is simply not sufficient. So you get courts being clogged by cases that come in day in and day out. And, and, and people, you know, get bogged down with this thing, and the perception then gets created that they're not doing anything, yet they are doing something. But the system is just difficult uh, to get to the, the bottle, the, the bottleneck is just too big. So one of the first things I would ask the assistance from would be to have resources for the NBA. What about the court starting on time? Is there a problem with the courts starting, let's say, at 9 o'clock in the morning throughout the country? 
if you look get at on the, with the job that they actually employed to do as prosecutors. If you look at the high courts, the high courts would normally start on time. Uh, I suppose because people were there, they, they act, you know, according to the situation they find themselves in. And then the regional courts, I find, normally start on time. But you have regional courts uh, which are in the outlined areas. And, and we have people that are still to be serviced. In those outlying areas, you have magistrates who don't stay in the town. You have prosecutors <coughs> who don't stay in the town. So we well must drive from somewhere, and then they get there, and then they still have to do the court preparations invariably. In those situations, they never start on time. They will start at around 11, half past 11, that kind of thing. And that's not on. And they still have to leave early because they must travel back. So court starting on time is possible, for some prosecutors do it. But they need assistance uh, for that to happen for, for, from, from everybody that's in the cluster. You, you need to, to have your, if there are prisoners, for instance, who need to be arraigned, they must be there on time as well, so that the court is on time. The magistrate must be there on time as well. The interpreter must be there on time as well. The stenographer must be there on time as well. The, the stenograph machine must actually be working for that to happen. So you might have all the uh, human resources there, but the machine, for some reason, is not working because there's no engine in the courtroom and so on. But it doesn't mean that court cannot start because there are things that you can still do. You can demand what needs to be demanded, where you need a uh, uh, stenographer machine and so on. So people also need to be innovative about the challenges that they have. Uh, the challenges will always be there. So you just don't sit because there's a challenge and say, I'm not going to start on time, I'm not going to proceed to this case because of this and that. So we need really to be proactive as well. Sometimes resources are not used optimally. You might have a court in the regional court, for instance, in the particular building not being used, and yet there are a number of uh, cases that are on trial on that day in another courtroom in the same building. But there's a court building, there's a courtroom sitting empty, and no one doing anything about it. So the court managers there uh, need to play a role. The counter prosecutors need to play a role. The head of the station, if it's a magistrate also need to play a role so that the resources that we have are used optimally. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, sir. Uh, no chasing. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, um, Advocate Mapoma, um, I was to ask you a question. In fact, you must, uh, I must ask you this question. The situation at the NPA started back in 1998. We are in only served six years. The rest is two years, and then it goes on and on and on, up to police is serving 11, 11 months, shown up from... NPA, how to manage pressure, you know, from, from uh, and, and the law, because that will be your salvaging thing. You, you stick to the constitution and not allow any pressure to, to be brought to bear on you. And, and your independence uh, must come out clearly. Uh, you must not uh, um, uh, bow to pressure. I'm not saying that other people did. I don't know what they faced. But uh, as much as uh, there will be pressure, it will be coming from all sectors of society. It will be coming from the top, from the bottom, from the sideways. So if you allow one form of pressure to influence you, surely another different form of pressure will also influence you. you decisions that the NPA takes are not always popular. Uh, someone will be unhappy at some stage about a decision that the NPA has taken. And th there will always be some complaint of some kind, some unhappiness of some kind about a decision that the NPA has taken. So you learn to live with that. But if your decisions are based on the Constitution and are based on the law. I think it's pressure that one can, can bear. Yeah. Uh, uh, <coughs> accepting that um, the NPA is not necessarily a separate arm of the government from the ordinary three arms of government. And the Constitution as well as the NPA Act requires that it must act independently. What is your understanding of this independence required from the NPA? What is the nature of that independence? In view of the fact that we are not introducing the Act or the Constitution does not 
introduce a new arm of government. You still remain with those three, but what is the nature of the independence expected or required from the NPA? The NPA is given the powers to prosecute in terms of section 179 of the Constitution. And those powers are translated into the NPA Act in section 20. And then section 22 of the NPA Act then gives the NTPP his powers to exercise that. That is where the independence, the, the independence comes from. It comes from the Constitution. That's the basis of it. The NPA is part of the executive arm of government. I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's program four or vote four. I don't know how they call it. I might uh, not be using the wrong term here. Of the Department of Justice and Corruption Services. And indeed, the Minister of Justice and Corruption Services is the minister responsible for the NPA. But in terms of accountability, uh, the accountability is to parliament. So its independence uh, pointedly comes from section 179 of the Constitution because it's the only institution that is given the mandate to, inst to institute and to, to criminal proceedings, to institute them, and to, uh, to, to, to withdraw such prosecutions. It's, 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 it's that arm only. So there's no other institution without authority. Now, in the exercise of those powers, what is the relation, in your understanding, what, is, what must be the relationship between the complainant and the NP, the prosecutorial authority, an accused person with the prosecutorial authority, police. How one manages those relations or what kind of relations, if any, uh, that must play out there? We were speaking earlier on about professionalism. The NPA must prosecute without fear or favor. That means that you don't fear the victim, you don't favor the victim. And with the accused as well, you don't fear the accused, you don't favor the accused. Because in your professionalism as the NPA, you are acting in the interests of the public, not a particular sect of society or a particular litigant, be it a victim or, or the accused. The NPA acts in terms of the constitution and the law. Now in terms of the law, for instance, uh, an accused person is with certain rights and the NPA cannot trouble upon those rights because we are prosecuting the person. We still have to respect those rights and make sure that uh, they are not trampled upon, especially by the NPA itself. If you look at the victim, the victim the victims come in different shapes and sizes. Um, the victims must be treated with decency. Uh, victims uh, who come to the NPA have nowhere, have nowhere else to go. They can't prosecute their cases on their own. So on their behalf, the NPA prosecutes. And the NPA must do that still without fear or favor. But where there's no evidence, it is still the NPA's duty to inform the victim that there will be no prosecution in this matter because of this and that, this and that, and not simply withdraw a matter and then the victim doesn't know what happened. Uh, because uh, people need to be engaged, uh, they need to be informed what is happening uh, with, the, with, the, with the matter at all times. But you have victims, for instance, uh, of, of sexual offenses who uh, are, are more vulnerable than, than other victims. And uh, the, the police of the NPA makes provision for how they must be treated. For instance, uh, use of the anti-rooms uh, in the NPA, NPA buildings, how they must be consulted, uh, uh, how, and, and how you apply Section 154, and 153 of the Criminal Procedure Act in terms of how they must testify, must they testify in camera, and so on, so they get treated differently. If they are victims of sexual offenses, if they are children victims, must they, uh, uh, for instance, testify through an intermediary, and so on. So you establish all of those things that will assist the victim to get <coughs> his or her case before the court. If you have got, on the other end, end of the scale, you have an accused, and you might have information uh, as the NPA that assists the accused. It is your duty as the NPA to inform the accused or, or, or the attorney that there is this information because it, it must be a, a fair prosecution. It cannot be prosecution at, uh, for a conviction at all costs uh, to contravene the Constitution and the law. Uh, that, that cannot be allowed. Question, Chair. The, the, the point. 
Um, let's make a scenario here. You have already <coughs> stated that the Minister of Justice is responsible for the NPA. He is involved. You want to arrest a particular minister or a, a, a senior general in the police must be arrested. Police apply for a warrant of arrest. We are in possession of a warrant of arrest. Is it necessary in your position to consult with the minister and possibly with the president before you arrest a minister or a general in the army? And if the minister says, please don't do it today, do it some other day, well, how would you handle such a situation? In fact, it has happened before. Firstly, the decision to prosecute must be taken by you as the NPA or as the NTPP, independently. The policy of the NPA says where there are certain decisions involving uh, certain things, uh, senior people that have to be taken, the NTPP himself must take those decisions for purposes of accountability. Now, in terms of consultation with the minister, when you consult with the minister, you're not consulting for permission. You are consulting or informing the minister that this will happen. And this is done as a matter of courtesy. Not because it's the law, but I think this is the right thing to do. Now, the minister will say to you, don't arrest him or her today, arrest him tomorrow. I will definitely consider that. As long as my decision to arrest or my decision to prosecute is not being undermined or overruled by the minister. That is where I will draw the line. Because the decision to arrest, the decision to prosecute has been taken and it cannot be overruled. The timelines of how we do it um, uh, will have to be worked out. Because there are certain things that uh, must, must still be done probably uh, by the president, if it's a minister, uh, how, how uh, he informs his cabinet, his other colleagues and so on. Uh, the one understands those things. And in fact, such decisions take place even at lower levels of society. Uh, I'm using that word in, in a very uh, uh, loose way. Because you get attorneys, for instance, coming to the NPA to say, my client uh, has an operation, for instance. Can he bring himself or herself to court on Friday or next week? My client will bring himself to court. Can we arrange that he's prepared to court and bail uh, be so much and so on. So these decisions get taken all the time at different levels. What is important is that the NPA's authority to take the decision must not be taken away. Thanks, sir. Machola. Thank you, Advocate Mapoma. Uh, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, just continuing with the discussion, um, with regard to the issue of independence, I, I I see that section 179, somewhere I think 179 6 provides that the Minister of Justice has got the final responsibility over the um, prosecuting authority. Um, and so I don't, I'd like to get your understanding of how that squares with what you've been saying, you know, of, in, of, of the independence of, of the. Of the uh, prosecuting authority if the, the, the minister has got that responsibility and 179 also provides that when the, the prosecuting authority formulates policy uh, that policy can be adopted after consultation with other uh, deputy I mean with, with the, 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 the DPPs but that it has to be with the concurrence of the minister, and so on. So where does the independence stand in that scenario? All right, thank you. If you look at um, sections 34 and 35 of the NPA Act, they talk about reporting, and you look there and you see what is being reported on. For instance, the NPA must report <coughs> about its state of affairs, about its personnel, about its financial situation, the training programs that it has for the prosecutors, uh, the policy directives that, it, that, that they are, and so on, financial implications about its operations, all these must be reported on. And in terms of the reporting line there, it is the minister uh, that is responsible for that, because the minister, for instance, is responsible for the funding uh, uh, of the NPA, because you, you, you get, as the NPA, 
your funding from the department's funding. So you need to, to, to inform the department what your programs are, how much you will need for this and that. The independence, as I understand it, is in the prostituting, in the decision to institute or to withdraw a prostitution. That independence, the minister has no role there at all. And uh, the reporting uh, line is, 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 is more of an administrative process because the NPA is part of the executive. It is not sitting there somewhere uh, alone. It is in a particular ministry who is accountable, who, who at parliament, it is the same minister who then goes to parliament and says, here's the report of the NPA. I am the minister responsible. I'm presenting it to parliament where the NPA is accountable to. So the independence is on the decision to prosecute or not to prosecute. Okay, thank you. And, and then in your letter to, to, you know, that you've written to us, you say that you want to be part of the process of restoring faith and confidence in our democracy. What do you mean and how do you propose to do that? Um, the NPA contributes to a number of programs that uh, are already out there in play. Um, if you look at the rule of law, for instance, if you look at uh, how crime is affecting our society, and for our society to live in freedom, you know, uh, and justice, uh, crime must be dealt with. We need to uh, lower crime, we need to deal with backlogs and, and many other things. So the NPA's contribution to the strengthening of the democracy is that there must be less crime or no crime in the country. Because we cannot practice our democracy, you know, proper, properly if we've got criminals uh, running around like they're doing now or taking over the country. That, that, that cannot be. So the constitutional democracy can only be enjoyed where there's stability, where the rule of law uh, rules, where the constitution rules, where law is obeyed, where the criminal justice cluster is functioning. And this democracy as well, uh, for it to happen, you know, our economy must be, must be strong, must be doing well, and for our economy to do well, the NPA's contribution there as well is to make sure that people who are brought to for prostitution are prostituted properly. If the one arm of the criminal justice cluster is not functioning properly, the criminal justice cluster fails. And if the criminal justice cluster fails, then we, we have no control over crime. And crime affects us all. As you're speaking, I'm trying to imagine you being in that office, and, but I don't see the action. As to what would you do to make sure that all these things that you say must fall in line do fall in line? You know, so you lost me a little bit. I lost you. Okay. You know, fine. One of the reasons I, I asked this question is because I thought that, like me, you think that the National Prosecuting Authority has lost confidence I mean, the public has lost confidence in the national club. It's like you, you're buying a used car and you've got to fix here and there. And I'm trying to find out how do we bring it to the ideal that is in your, in your, in, in your letter. For me, I'm not, I'm not sitting here with the view that the, the NPA has lost, people have lost confidence in it. I have not lost confidence in the NPA, otherwise I will not be here. There might be people who are not able with the NPA for this and that other reason. But if you look at uh, prostitutes uh, working there on the ground, the number of convictions that the NPA still has in the, in the courts out there, you will see that a lot of good is being done. But there is a perception advocate. Yes, I'm, you, I'm going you to know, How that. do you deal with that perception? Yes. And, and for me, even that perception, I need to understand it firstly. Is it a perception? Uh, why is this perception? You, you don't fix a problem without first understanding it. Otherwise, you'll be fixing a problem that somebody says to you, there's a problem there, go and fix that. You yourself, you go to the place, you understand the problem, and then you fix it. And when you fix the problem, you've got people who are already there, working there in the NPA, that you must work with. And uh, sometimes they're part of the problem, sometimes they're not. So you need to get to the place first and to understand what is the problem. I don't want to make an assumption and say there's a problem, there's a perception. I would not be a lawyer if I work on perceptions. I'm a lawyer, I work on facts. 
Thanks, uh, Advocate Celia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, Edward Palmer. Good morning, Mr. You'll probably agree with me that the MPA is a very complex organization. Very okay. unique and complex within our society. Okay. You will deal with will deal with in a very specialized field as head of this organization. Yes. And you will deal with professional people who are mostly difficult people to manage. So I would agree lawyers, I, I would agree some of them are. Lawyers are usually difficult people to manage. Would you agree with me? Yes. And also involved in, in this job as head of the uh, NPA, there will be a, an important factor, and that's possible or potential interference in decisions because of the immense importance of some of the decisions that you have to make. Yes, I respect that one. Now, therefore, it seems to me that experience to deal with a situation, a unique situation of this nature, will be a very important factor that we will have to take in consideration in advising the President uh, on our views of the appointment of the NDPP. You, I'm sure you will appreciate that. I appreciate that. Now, I've looked at your CV and it appears that you had a couple of years of experience in, in the uh, prosecuting environment in the late 80s up to the uh, mid-1997 when you started articles at a firm of attorneys. Yeah. Then again in, what was it, 2001, you returned to the NPA or to the prosecuting uh, environment till January 2007. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thereafter, for the past 10 years, you didn't have any real experience in the management and or dealing with the unique problems that uh, an NDPP will be confronted with. Will I be correct if I assume that? Yeah. That is a bit of a concern <coughs> to me. Uh, as far as your court experience is concerned, it appears to me that in the last couple of years, you, you had, obviously, as a practicing advocate, you appeared in various divisions of the High Court. Yes. On a reasonably regular basis, I suppose. Yes. But I saw that you've never actually appeared in the Constitutional Court. No, I have not. You have only appeared once in the SCA, and that was as a junior to uh, led by senior counsel. Yes. So in that sense, it seems to me your experience, with great respect, and I'm not criticizing for you for that, but the objective facts are that your experience is a bit lacking in that sense. Would you agree with me? In the sense of the court appearances in the sea, yes. In our senior courts. In the senior courts, in our yes. highest courts. And Probably part of leading the NPA will be to lead by example. Yes. That should be so. Yes. And the criminal part of our law forms the subject of very regular cases in our highest courts, whether the Constitutional Court and or the SCA. Yes where members of the MPA themselves appear or will have to appear. Yes. Do you perceive your lack of experience, and I say that for, for lack of a better word maybe, will be any negative relating to your assuming the duties of the NDPP at this stage of your career? 
Not at all. Why do you say that? A leader of the NPA is a leader that, has, that must have many qualities of leadership, different qualities of leadership. Um, you, you may have a prosecutor who is the top, top of, of his or her class uh, in, in the prosecution field only. And that prosecutor might not necessarily be the best person to lead an organization of several thousand people. Because you need a different skill set for that. One of the most important skills that you need uh, in, in, in the NPA is, is stakeholder management, for instance, uh, and, and your ability to know who the top prosecutors are and to support them to do their job well. Because if you are a good leader, those who are doing their jobs well, where they are in the organization, you must support them. You must not necessarily be better than them. They actually should be better than you for the organization as a whole to, to succeed. So I don't see that as a problem at all. Because my understanding of the law is not any less. And you must remember as well that uh, decisions to prosecute are taken at various levels in the organization. And uh, it's not the NTP, uh, the person, who must take these decisions on all the cases uh, that actually appear before court. So the various TPPs, the various TPPs in the various offices has certain, have certain autonomy to take certain decisions and to take certain matters to go to court. So as the NPA head, your, your role in this situation would be to make sure that your procedures will go to court, excel there, and that is good. So I don't see a problem. But with your role as NDPP, not in turn <coughs> advising and instructing members of your personnel on how to conduct cases, for instance, in the SCI or in the Constitutional Court. Be told. And with the fact that you have never actually appeared there, not be a problem for you in building a relationship with your personnel under these circumstances. Not at all. People management skills, uh, people management skills, you know. I've, I've dealt with a very senior counsel uh, in, in my life. And uh, I, I dare say, uh, I've, in my interactions with them, you know, I've, sometimes you point out the difference between you and how this is, is a particular matter. And it's done all the time. If, if they are lawyers, they would understand that. Uh, lawyers understand that there are different views Lawyers accept, you know, uh, uh, people when they uh, question their decisions for, for a good reason. Uh, research is being done, cases are different. There is no lawyer who knows all. So even if you've got your most, most senior prosecutor who will say, I'm, I'm the one who has gone to the SA 25 times or 30 times, so I'm, I'm, I can't listen to anything from you, I would not think that that person would be a lawyer. Lawyers don't do that in my experience, especially at a senior level. Lawyers at a senior level are more welcoming of ideas because they've not got nothing to prove to anyone. So uh, lawyers that uh, are very, very senior uh, are very welcoming, you know, to, to engage uh, and, and to look and see different views. The law is changing now. Uh, I mean, the Constitution itself is a 1996 document. We have got so many other laws that have come since democracy. So the issue of experience is, 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 is relative, because you have to look and see what kind of experience you're talking about. So you might have prosecuted cases way back in 1985 or whatever, but you, you now have to look at, 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 at what we have. We, we need a change of organization, which must be moving with the times. So the experience that people have is always welcome, but a lawyer as conservative as they are, they need to move with the times as well. So I'm, I don't think it would be a problem to deal with the very, very senior colleagues who have been in the, in the NPA for longer than I am and who have prosecuted in the very high cost. Because I've dealt with the senior counsel and there's been no problem. Do you agree with me, you are in private practice now, that the office of the NPA is in a turmoil now. There is a crisis at this stage public did lose to some extent confidence in the office of the NPA in the past couple of years? There is a perception that the media is certainly uh, uh, playing a role in, in that perception. But I, I would not readily agree and say yes, because I don't know what the exact problem in the, in the NPA is. 
and, and if you read the news like any other person and, and you interpret them, because working uh, in the court rooms themselves, I don't see the courts falling apart. Uh, and, and this is where people go to, they go to the courts. People don't go to the NPA at, at which I'm building and, and, and then they feel the NPA there. They see what is happening in the courtrooms when they get there. And there, the, the courts are still functional, the NPA is still functional. I'm sure it can be better, but the, 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 the perception about the NPA, I think it varies uh, depending on which case is topical at the time uh, that the media has latched on and then they say this or that. But for me, I would not want to be swayed either way. I, I first need to understand what exactly the problem is before I, I can commit any kind of answer to that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, sir. Uh, Sikoko. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Advocate Maboma. In your CV, it is clear that you were in many uh, different institutions. Can you tell us how the experience that you accumulated throughout these other institutions will assist you in leading the NPA? Thank you. Um, my experience, I think, has enhanced uh, my people skills. It has enhanced my, my independence. It has enhanced my, my way, how I deal with the stakeholders, how I deal with the bureaucracy. Uh, it has enhanced how I deal with uh, with finances. It has enhanced, you know, how I deal with uh, what one would have as stumbling blocks uh, in any organisation. And I've interacted uh, with fairly senior people uh, in, in, in my in my in my career, and I think I've managed those relationships uh, very very well. Uh, my career has shown me that you don't get things done now. You need to be patient uh, with people. I've obviously learned a lot about, about people management, about different types of organizations, and the uh, stages and lives of organizations. The NPA now might be as part of its life, at a part where it is difficult for it, but it is a stage, it's not permanent. So there are things that you do to get it out of that particular stage into another stage. And uh, things like this uh, probably will happen for one or another reason you know, down the line, but you need uh, stability. So my, my, my experience uh, in, my, in my other organizations have uh, trained me to deal with uh, employees. I mean, when, when I was at Autopex, uh, I used to deal quite a lot with uh, Satao, uh, which was uh, the, the, the union uh, where I was. And um, <coughs> we, we managed, you know, to live, and the, and the organization thrived at, at the time. Although my time there was short-lived, but I've learned how to deal with different uh, what is problems, you know, and, and crises. And the best way to deal with the crisis is to avoid it before it happens. For instance, at the at Transnet, I was a member of the crisis committee, you know, which got activated when there was a crisis. So you, you get to deal with different people. Thank you. You, you strike me as a firm person. Uh, uh, the way you are interacting with us. So I want you to assure this panel if there is nothing that can compromise you if you take this position of NDP. Compromise me in, in what sense? In, in a sense that maybe there could be a hold on you that could compromise your independence. Well, I can assure the panel right now that uh, I'm not beholden to anyone. I'm very independent. I, I don't owe anyone uh, uh, anything except the usual banks for my bond and stuff. Um, but there's no one that uh, I, I owe a favor to, uh, that kind of thing. I don't know, I might have a traffic ticket somewhere that I'm not aware of that I might not have paid, uh, which might be a problem. Uh, but I try to pay them as well uh, when they get to my attention on time. Uh, I think that's the only thing that can compromise me. It would be an unpaid traffic ticket that I'm not aware of. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, uh, Advocate Manya. Uh, thank you, Chair. Mr. Uh, let me start first with the um, case study uh, that you dealt with earlier on. Uh, in the case study, um, and your answers there too, 
I found that you have not said anything about investigating further. You simply said that there is nothing. You have not seen anything to lead to prosecution of anyone, but you're not saying or addressing Mr. Zubaina's concern to say at least we have to investigate this now that it has been brought to our attention. Why? Well, I, I could stop before I could finish uh, my, uh, my, my response. Because in my responses, uh, uh, Mr. Mani, to Mr. Nguenya and to, and to Bridget, to the minister and so on, I, I'm, I'm very clear that this matter I must be referred to SAPS, South African Police Services. I need to find out from SAPS uh, if there's an investigation on this matter. And if not, then it's a matter for them to investigate. So we cannot, as the NPA, be taking over that role in the fashion that is suggested here. SAPS has to be involved. Thank you. Now, the various individuals with interest in that case study that came to the office of the NPP and says, if you prosecute, this will happen or will compromise the interest, national interest of the Republic. How do you deal with that? The NPA policy uh, says, when you decide to prosecute, the national economic interest is not a factor. Yes. The identity of the person to be prosecuted is not a factor. Our relations as a country with another country uh, should not be a factor. The only thing that you look into when you prosecute is whether this is in terms of our own constitution and our own laws. And if our own laws say prosecute, that's what you do. And the evidence supports that. Thank you. I disbelieve to your uh, answer to some of the panel members relating to the uh, faith or leg of thereof by the public of South Africa in the office of the NDPB. And you seem to be oblivious to that. You say that, well, the media, the perception, as if what Mr. Uh, Nojesi has uh, tried to elaborate on on those people that had been in that office that did not even stay long in those offices. Surely that indicates that there is instability uh, and chaos as uh, my colleagues have already said in the office of the NPP and you are oblivious to that. How is that possible? I'm not oblivious to what the media reports. Context of my answer. I'm not talking about, about the, what medi the media yes. reports. Yes, I'm saying answer. the public out there, all of us sitting here, have already said to you, and Mr. Nojais has illustrated to you that no one has stayed in that office for more than three years, and he simply said that maybe you'll be the first. And you're saying that there are no, there's no instability according to you. You are not aware of that. No, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not aware of what is being reported, Mr. Man. I'm saying, for one, to make proper decisions you need to get there and you establish what is actually happening. I will not want to get there with a particular perception that I got from what the media is reporting. I need to get there, you establish the facts, and actually deal with the problem that I know firsthand. It would be not the right thing to do to, to walk in there uh, filled with uh, uh, perceptions that you pick up from various media reports. Okay. Let me put it this way to you. Uh, the public, the country, the president is yearning for earth-shattering change in the NPA office. And you are saying to us that, well, if you go there, it will, always, it will be almost uh, more of the same because the values are there. All that is needed is just to, you know, revive them instill them into the personnel of the NDPB's office and everything will be fine. Whereas the country, public, demands more than just that. 
And he was saying almost to us that, well, if you go there, it will always be more of the same. No, that's what I'm saying. What are you saying? If when I get there, I realize that what indeed is been reported is absolutely there, then one needs to act and do something about it. It is, I believe, not correct to get several media reports and then you simply walk into a, an institution and then you have those perceptions. For you to make a proper turnaround time, you need to establish the facts and then you act appropriately with the facts that you know. Mr. Malcolm, I believe that you are a practitioner. Yes. And uh, I don't know your, your view with the media because you seem to be blaming the media for reporting. I'm not blaming them. But anyway, it's fine. <laughs> the media say they can defend themselves. <laughs> anyway, uh, you, you, you answered a question from uh, Mr. Matthews that uh, some of the considerations in the decision making that you'll be making if you are um, recommended will be out of courtesy to some individuals. Why? The seniority as committee members might require that it be done because what you do it is not you, it's, the, it's your responsible minister who does that. To say, I'm going to be arresting your colleague, I've taken a decision to prosecute, and you simply extend the hand of criticism. I don't see anything wrong with that at all. Is that part of the policy in the NPA? Yes. That you give certain... Your mic is off. Your mic is off. Okay. that I'm um, the only one with the working mic out. Oh, it appears as if they are now working. Just wait for a minute for Mr. Noches so that we continue to be appropriately constituted.
can proceed to advocate mine. Thank you, uh, Chair. Can, can you, you were just about to answer my question. Do you still want me to repeat it or you have No, I, I, no. You yeah. may proceed. Yes, the policy provides for that. They provide it in a way where they say these decisions must be taken and for accountability. Because if certain senior people get prosecuted, somebody must be accountable for that and at senior level, that is at uh, your NPA or TNTPP or NTPP level. But the, the policy certainly allows for that. It's not against policy if, if you do that. And in any event, that kind of criticism can also be extended to people who are not ministers, right. to, to other people as well. Thank you. Let me just understand what you just said, that uh, when you arrest certain ministers, uh, somebody has to be accountable. There has to be accountability. For the decision taken. For the decision taken. Yes. Only for the ministers. No, no, not necessarily. They don't set out the actual type of senior people. So I guess uh, there will be some exercise of discussion somewhere. All right. Thank you. Now, uh, I'll assume again, without concluding that, if you are not aware, as you sit here, for this panel, that of the chaotic nature in the N NDPP's office, you do not, as you sit right here, have any kind of action plan. You don't know what is it that needs to be remedied to sort out all the chaos that is prevailing right now. You don't have a clue about it. Am I correct in that assessment? The case study that we're given does not reflect any chaos in the NPA, and generally, for you to have an action plan, you first have to have the facts. And the chaos that you're referring to, uh, if, for instance, you can say to me, this is the chaos that I'm talking about, and then factually that is what is happening with NPA, then I will answer you. Right. But I don't think it would be fair uh, for me to be expected uh, to assume the type of, my, my chaos might be different to yours. You might have different facts, I might have different facts, but, uh, 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 might be out there in the public. So I will not be able to answer you correctly without me saying, or you saying, this is, this is, this is, these are the problems. So what is your turnaround time? How to solve this? How to solve that? Okay. Yeah. Let me tell you as a fact that it has already been uh, accepted by senior individuals in the NDPB that they are chaos free. That's a fact. Okay? Now, if you are not aware of those and and uh, it means that you will need time once you are, if the president decides that way, appointed. You will need time to acquaint yourself with the inner workings of the NDPP, correct? I will need time to understand what the problems are, yes. And you also need time to further strategize as to how to resolve all those issues. Yes, depending on the problem. Now, my, my, my question is, do you think this... Uh, country, the community, society out there has, how much time do you want from them? From the media as well, since you have been lambasting the media. How much time do you need from them? No, for a fact, I'm not lambasting the media. Uh, yes, I'm not. It depends. For instance, when you use you know, the word chaos, you know, I don't know what you know. I don't know the facts that you have that lead you to say there's chaos there. Somebody else might have fewer facts than you. Somebody else might uh, interpret it differently. I don't know. So I would not want to make that kind of uh, assumption. But if you walk into an organization, even if uh, the chaos is small, even if the chaos is big, your turnaround depends on, on several things. One, if you quickly identify the problem. One, you provide a solution. This can take two days, this can take three days. But the turnaround is now the actual making it better will take longer, obviously. And that also depends on the senior management that you have around you, you know, on the goals that you have set, the, the achievability, the, the, the timelines, and the support that you get as well from, from, the, from, from, from other role players. Because this, this should not be a one-person uh, job. Once you get there, there is a lot of cooperation that you need from various sectors, various stakeholders, even internally in the NPA, I'm sure there are people who are not part of the chaos that you're mentioning. And even those who are uh, doing the chaos, uh, I'm sure once we know who they are and what they are doing, we'll be able to deal with them immediately. 
but you, you first need to understand and know what the problem is. Okay. Uh, we have already been told that there is a prevailing culture at the NDPP's office. Do you know anything about the culture at the NDPP's office? I've heard about the prevailing culture. So you had at least heard about that one? Yes, and many others. And many others. Please en enlighten us on that culture that, that you know something about. I've, I've heard about factionalism in the NPA. I've heard about um, uh, lack of discipline. Uh, to name uh, just a few. Okay, lack of discipline and uh, factionalism will render that institution <coughs> chaotic. Do you accede to that? To an extent, yes. <coughs> and if you already know about those two and you still do not <coughs> have a action plan how to deal with those that you have just identified. I still maintain Yes, uh, if you talk fictionalism, for instance, there might be one or two individuals who are causing the problems. It's not that the whole institution is affected by this and, and so on, but the way things get reported, they get reported differently by different media at different times for different reasons. So I would still not want to accept and say this organization is chaotic. And then I assume that it's chaotic that I'm working there, assuming that it's chaotic. But what is the chaos that is there? How is it affecting other operations? Because they are part of the NPA that are not chaotic, that are functioning properly. So those you need to enhance and make them work better. And where there are those factions, you deal with the individuals of course on the faction. And for that, for you to deal with those individuals, even if you have to institute disciplinary hearings, for instance, that does not happen in a day. There are processes that may still need to be followed for you to deal with individuals that are causing a problem in the NPA. So if I give you timelines now and say a month or two weeks, I'll have dealt with this thing, I'll be lying to you. Because you deal with different problems according to the prevailing provisions of the law and the historic codes and so on. So there are people who definitely who are causing problems, but they must be dealt with as well according to the law and that takes time as well, depending on the situation and the facts at hand. Thanks, sir. Uh, Advocate Mapoma. Do you have uh, previous convictions in a court of law? No, sir, I do not. Is there any question you want to ask the panel? Uh, I can't offer anyone at the moment. <laughs> okay, it's been a long time. So you'll be informed via the presidency about the outcome of this interview. Thank you, thank you very much for availing yourself for the interview. I can only say thank you for, for, for the opportunity as well. Thank you. Pleasure. Advocate Makari.
Good afternoon, Advocate Makari. Good afternoon. How are you today? I'm well, and you? Very well. Thank you. We have here in the panel, on my right, uh, the Auditor General, Makwetu. On his immediate right is uh, Mr. Scott. Mr. Notiesi, on my left, uh, uh, Majola. Next to him is uh, Advocate Celia, followed by uh, Mr. Sigogo and Advocate Maya. You applied for the position of the National Director of Public Prosecutions? Yes. You are a Chief Prosecutor at the moment? Yes. In Northwest? Okay. You've been with the NPA from 1988. Yes. Yeah, it's a long time, eh? Yeah, 20 years. You've got a master's degree as well? Yes. And you're currently doing an LLD? Yes. In what? LD in what? Uh, in customary law. In customary law. We gave you an assignment in terms of the case study. So can you briefly indicate to us your response to this case study, take into account the Constitution, the NPA Act, as well as uh, various uh, judgments of our courts, especially the Constitutional Court, with particular reference uh, to your being a fit and proper person to be appointed as a National Director of Public Prosecutions, and all those uh, attributes of experience, of integrity, of conscientiousness, of impartiality, independence, uh, taking decisions without any fear, favor, or prejudice. So if you can be pointed uh, in your response, because we want to see the silent points that we utilized in uh, coming up with uh, the case study solution. Thank you very much, Shay. Before I proceed, there is something that I would like to raise. Um, amongst you as a panel, I want you to know that there is a person that I'm related to, who is Mr. Sigogo. How are you related to him? He is a distant cousin, but I think it's fit and proper that I should uh, uh, express that so that the panel should know that it is related to me. Wait, if I may ask Mr. Sigogo, do you feel you are conflicted in this interview? No, I don't feel conflicted as she has indicated. She's a distant cousin, indeed a distant that I sometimes do not know how to connect, but we, we, know, we, we know as we're from the, the villages that uh, there's some uh, distant uh, relations. So I don't see there's any conflict of interest at all. Okay, thank so you. So you may proceed. Okay, but thank thanks you. for highlighting that uh, it shows uh, integrity. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the case study that we were given to look at, um, to sum it up, it's more about the fit and proper person in the person of the National Director of Public Prosecutions. Because it's reflecting upon a banker who is coming to South Africa with other intentions rather than to do business and who also has some connections with the president and then that also bring to the fore the question about his relation with the president because the president according to the case study requested uh, a meeting with the National Director of Public Prosecutions mm -hmm. to discuss certain issues relating to the same case. And in a subtle manner, the President indicated that he believes that the National Director, when they meet, will do the right thing by not prosecuting this person because of uh, the interest relating to the economy. Of course, the economy is important in a country. Uh, without a viable economy, the country can survive. So what I looked at 
at the position of the NDPP, how the NDPP should react in that circumstances, where the president is somewhat saying it in a subtle manner that will do the right thing and not consider prosecuting, which I regard as interference with the function of the National Director of Prosecutions. Therefore, the National Director of Prosecutions cannot be influenced by any person, be it the president, the minister, anybody, cannot be influenced in taking a decision to prosecute, which means uh, the prosecutorial independence uh, 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 lies with the prosecutors. It can be influenced by anybody else. However, there is also a, a scenario where the minister intends to see the very same National Director of Public Prosecutions, um, indicating that there are also issues that need to be discussed, and that also has to do with the very same case. My understanding here of the National Prosecuting Authority Act is that the minister has a final responsibility over the NPA as an institution. In any event, the budget vote of the NPA is part of the Department of Justice. So the minister oversees the functions of the uh, NPA, but not the prosecutorial functions. Only on issues pertaining to performance, pertaining to administrative issues, it could be the, the question about uh, resources, that's where the minister has uh, to oversee. And then on the other hand, uh, uh, it's also reflecting that the relationship between the minister and the national director of public prosecution is of paramount for the institution to succeed. Because if there is no cordial relationship, the two cannot take this organization forward. One would look at the, the, the commission of inquiry, the, the Ginola Commission, where some of these issues were raised relating to the relationship between the, uh, uh, the, the National Director of Pro Public Prosecutions and the Minister, where it was raised that the relationship was irretrievably broken down. You can imagine under those circumstances how those people will be able to function, which means it will have a detrimental effect on the institution itself. Therefore, the two has to function and work together, although there should be an understanding that when it comes to the uh, uh, prosecutorial independence and discretion, it's only the national director who has that, not the minister. There is also another scenario uh, relating to the question of uh, uh, state security, where the DG has uh, um, wrote to, 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 the, to the national director about the conduct of one of the deputy national directors who had decided to do certain investigations relating to this individual. My understanding here is that um, since the demise of the Scorpions, the DSO, the National Prosecuting Authority doesn't have investigative authority. Therefore, unless if the president has issued by proclamation that certain investigation should be conducted, it cannot be done. Therefore, the, 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 the DG of the SSA was correct to somewhat feel uncomfortable that MPA is now taking over the functions which belongs to the SSA, which has to do with the national security, which has to, to, to look after the question of national security which I feel I agree, and that in my capacity as the NDPP, I would basically acknowledge that what the Deputy National Director has done was not correct, and one should apologize to that, and start having communication as to how should we continue forward in, in dealing with issues to be able to separate issues of national security and the mandate of, of, of the National Prosecuting Authority, because the mandate of the National Prosecuting Authority is to prosecute, is not to investigate. And the minute there is a question of national security, whatever has been uh, collected, 
whatever is there must immediately be forwarded to the national to the uh, uh, to the security agency because the the, the 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 national prosecuting authority doesn't have a mandate to do that another scenario in a question of an email it's a, a question about a prosecutor who has uh, the, the, the misconduct and somebody anonymously forwarded a, a, a message about his conduct that this person is uh, disclosing issues pertaining to the case that is being investigated. And that anonymous person, it's something that should be encouraged that people should voice out certain issues that possibly the national director may not be aware of, so that they must be dealt with. Because this person is disclosing information that is not supposed to disclose. And it's the person also who has so many misconducts, which means IMU, which is an, a, a unit within National Prosecuting Authority, must immediately uh, start to investigate this matter and see as to whether there is merit and whether this person, uh, some, some steps shouldn't be taken against the person. Although I would personally encourage the anonymous person, as we know that evidence is paramount, to come forward, to be brave enough to come forward and to, to indicate or, or bring forward the evidence that is there so that steps, serious steps should be taken, uh, uh, taken about this person. Because the organization can't afford to keep a person of that caliber who is going to continue to compromise the information within the institution, which will, at the end of it all, uh, uh, jeopardize whatever prosecutions that are supposed to, to be undertaken. The other scenario is about the DG of the Department of Justice, uh, uh, who was also requesting certain information relating to resourcing and other things, of which, according to me, I believe that according to PFMA, uh, uh, the DG has the right to request that. It has nothing to do with the prosecutorial decision and discretion. It's all about administrative issues. He is the accounting officer, therefore he will require those things. And we need as NPA to be accountable, to give that information that the organization is run properly and that there is no wasteful and fruitless expenditures because at the end of the day the director general will have to account in parliament about the, the expenditure as uh, NPA is part of, of Department of Justice. Okay. Auditor General. Um, thank you, Chair. Good morning, Advocate Makari. Good morning. I am going to, before I get to my main question, I'm going to quote directly from your covering letter when you send your CV uh, in response to the invitation to apply. In one paragraph you say, <clears throat> I quote, I have served under several NDPPs during my time at the NPA. I have witnessed the highs and the lows of this very important institution. Unquote there. 20 years on the ground. Please share with us some detail around all of these highs and lows that you have encountered over this period, as well as any role you played in the events that unfolded, as you described them in your uh, covering letter. Thank you very much. Indeed, I've been a prosecutor for about 30 years. When the organization was, came to its inception, I was there. I've been through all the national directors who were there. Let me start by saying, when this organization was formed, it became a vibrant institution. Prosecutors were proud to be called prosecutors. Everybody enjoyed to serve in this organization. Things appeared and systems appeared to be in place because we enjoyed also the confidence 
of the South Africans. But as time went on, somehow that trust and confidence start to get eroded. I don't want to insinuate that somebody did anything wrong, but it, 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 it proved itself that as the years went by, the institution was no longer the institution that was then in 1998. As we speak right now, uh, thank goodness for the media that is here, you see, you hear what is in the public domain. It's not something that as a prosecutor, you can raise your head and be proud that I'm a prosecutor because it appears that our country, our people have lost confidence in us. Remember, you can't demand to be respected. You have to earn that respect. So it appears that the respect that we enjoyed back then has been eroded. And that's one thing that is of institution. It's vibrant. It's alive. It's doing its work according to its mandate of the constitution, which is to prosecute without fear, favor, and prejudice. People need to see us demonstrating that. We are criticized. One may say justified or unjustified, but the fact of the matter is, if there is a sign that that trust has been eroded. We can't just go out to people and say, we are demanding that you should respect us. We are demanding that you should have confidence in us. We have to find the cause and rectify the cause if there is a cause so that we, re we, inst we restore the, re the, 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 the respect that the people of this country should have in us. So it's true that a lot happened. I, for one, I personally have learned so many things from all the national directors who have been uh, uh, at NPA. I could see some were greater than others. Just like that novel where it says some animals are... Uh, I, I, I'm failing to... Sorry? Uh, yeah, some animals are more equal than others. Animal farm. Yeah, animal farm. So some were greater, some were much more greater, some were not so great. And that's why the, our institution is where it is right now and is the duty today of this panel of gentlemen, although I don't see a lady, you to make there. sure... Oh, I'm here, thank you. <laughs> to make sure that whoever you are going to appoint must be a great leader to take that institution from where it is, how we are perceived, to be great. Because it can be taken where it is now by a professor, say for argument's sake, or by a, a, an expert, or I usually say by a technician. Because this institution right now doesn't need that. It needs a great leader who can think out of the box a great leader who has integrity, a great leader who has credibility, a great leader who has professionalism, a great leader who believes in service excellence, so that, and a great leader who is accountable so that this institution can rise from where it is to greater heights. Thank you very much. Just a follow up on that. And you've pretty much read my mind about some of the stuff that I was talking about to raise. Now that you are sitting here and you are being considered as that great leader to address the erosion of public confidence and trust, as you have said, what would be the primary issues in your mind that you believe as this potential great leader headed to the NPA would do? What are those things that we can expect from Advocate Makari 
in the light of the history you've, you've de described. And perhaps I would like you to put yourself at the center, wear these shoes of this great leader now, and describe to us what would you be at the top of your mind in making sure that you restore that public confidence into the institution. The thing that comes immediately into my mind about the great leader that I'm talking about is integrity. Integrity, you can have it or you don't. There are no gray areas. So if there is a leader who has integrity, people will notice. People will be able to see that this leader indeed is sticking to their mandate. Because who is, who is this great leader? Myself. Why don't you say so? I was trying to be modest. No, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. Uh, this great leader, Ophi. which I say is myself, I have proved to be a woman of integrity. Where I work as a chief prosecutor, my prosecutors, they know <coughs> you can't be next to this woman unless you are on the straight and narrow. Because integrity to me is paramount. And I've demonstrated that. Because a great leader, by what you are, you influence those who are below you and those who are above you. Because they'll be able to see and emulate what you project. So that's why I'm saying integrity is paramount. That's why a person who is fit and proper should be a man or woman of integrity. In this instance, I'm the woman of integrity. The second aspect that I'll bring to you is credibility. A great leader doesn't say something and go and act otherwise. There must be consistency. Because how do we expect people to take us serious? If we, we are saying this today, but tomorrow they see me acting in a different way than what I've just said. It's like just paying lip service. And a great leader cannot be that. A great leader must show credibility. When I say this tablecloth is white, it should be white. I shouldn't be saying this microphone is white when it's black. People must be able to see that truly indeed, this woman, what she says, she stick by it. When we say we are going to prosecute without fear, favor, or prejudice, it must be demonstrated. Let me say this to you. As a prosecutor, I don't feel proud by the fact that we are dragged most of the time before the court of law in certain instances where our decisions have to be reviewed because somebody somehow they realize that our decisions either they are illegal or irrational and the minute we are categorized in that space it erodes what people perceive about us where is our credibility where is our integrity so a leader that I'm talking about a great leader, it's a leader who will instill that in an institution. Let me also put this. Leadership is something very different. To be a leader is not to be placed in a position of power and we wake up and say you are a leader. You are a leader because you are in that position of power. A great leader is a leader who is in a position of power or not, but provides leadership. Wherever this leader is, there is leadership. Something that I've observed as a person is that to be a great leader, sometimes you have to be born that way. Because leadership, you won't find it in the classroom. As the chairperson has indicated that I have a B juris degree, I have a LLB degree, I have a master's degree, I'm busy now with my LLD degree. In all this sphere of my schooling, I never received any training about leadership. That's why to me I believe that 
To be a great leader, you are born. Why? Because there are certain attributes that you won't get it anywhere. A great leader is the most forgiving person you can ever come across. We can't even go further. Our Nelson Mandela is an example, a typical example. Because if you don't have that space to forgive, how will you work with people? For example, right now, although I can't confirm it because it's rumors that we read, we hear that in our institution there is a deep division, which I don't know, I can't confirm that. If, say, for argument's sake, it's true, if you're not a great leader, how are you going to bring all these people together? So, which means the institution will go down the drain. You just, have to be a... Just if I may interrupt you, uh, maybe we'll try and conclude this part. In my very first question, I also underlined you to share with us the role you played during these highs and lows. And of course you are describing, oh, yes. you are describing the great leader into the future. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to use whatever examples you are using now to describe integrity, credibility and all of that, to share with us how they found expression within the environment in which you have been leading where we experienced all of these highs and lows. And I really want you to be very brief yes. in answering that part. That's all that's left okay. for me now, then Th I can pass on. Thank you very much. In my area of jurisdiction, I work with prosecutors who are a team, a formidable team. If I may tell you, despite whatever goes around us, we are able, without resources at times, to achieve what sometimes seem to be unachievable because of the leadership that has displayed. In my CV, I think you might have read that at some point I started a, 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 a Saturday court. A Saturday court where people were not being paid, not a cent, in winter. I had to bring the magistrates on board, the, the attorneys on board, and we worked during that period and we finalized case about 115 cases. That shows leadership to say, amidst challenges, we're still coming out with some ways of resolving the challenges that we are experiencing. We are working as a team. We do things together. Whenever there is anything that affects a particular prosecutor, it, it affects all of us. If I can give you an example that at the DPP office, where my office is based, I had influence, I have influence such that even when people's morale is at the lowest, I'm able to encourage them. If I may also tell you, right now as I'm speaking, advocates at the DPP office have been sending me messages of, of encouragement because to them they see what I'm able to impart in them. And the other thing that I do also, I believe in encouraging others to be better, to be better than me. I can sacrifice myself for the next person. And that has a huge impact because it shows the people that I'm leading that you still have future in this organization. You still have tomorrow in this organization. You can hang on there, these challenges will pass, and at the ultimate end, you'll be what you want to be. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Advocate Matozzi uh, Makari, good afternoon. Afternoon. The, my <coughs> AG has stolen a bit of my thunder. I was going to ask some of the questions that he had picked up on, but I just want you to turn to your CV, um, more particularly your profile um, as Chief Prosecutor of the Mabato Cluster, yeah. uh, Northwest and the NPA professional for the last two decades and that this involved, comprised 12 officers and 64 personnel. Uh, and prior to this, you spent 10 years at the Department of Justice as a prosecutor. Then I see um, in the 27th of June, 2014, was when you got admitted as an advocate. Is that correct? Yes, it's correct. Of the High Court. In the, and I note from your um, work history, um, which is still current, is that it would appear that most of your functions as the Chief Prosecutor are those involving management yes. of a significant number of personnel. 
Would that be a correct assumption? Yes. Whilst you have been appointed as an advocate, or pursuant to being appointed as an advocate in the High Court, have you in fact appeared in the High Court in any criminal cases um, in the area where your cluster is situated? Yes, I must say I haven't. Uh, the structure of our organization is in such that it comprises of three aspects. Leaders, or we may call them managers, specialist prosecutors, and general prosecutors. I have been mostly focused on management. I would, I would believe if I had the opportunity, or given that opportunity, to can go to court, I would have been able maybe to say with confidence that this is what I have done. But the manner we, it's structured, I haven't had an opportunity to appear at the High Court. Just, um, I've listened to what you have said earlier to the AG, and I can see now why you have received the Fearless Executive Leadership Achievers Award on more than one occasion. Yes. Um, in your position as Chief Prosecutor, have you had um, a situation where you and other Chief Prosecutors throughout the country have been asked to attend at the offices of the National um, Director of Public Prosecutions for any reason re relative or relating to um, your functions as a Chief Prosecutor or Chief Prosecutor Directors throughout the country? I recently. Sorry, I may put recently or in the near... Uh, uh, the only time where I participated in the management meetings at the, next of, at the National Director's Office. It's way back when I was still not even a senior prosecutor. The person who was acting DPP is the one who used to go with me to these meetings because he immediately discovered the leadership in me and take me along. For now, I haven't been participating in those meetings at all. Thank, thank you. I've got no further questions. Thanks, uh, no chasing. Thank you, sir. Um, good afternoon, afternoon. counsel. I'm okay. Firstly, do you belong to any political organization? No. I used to belong to a political organization years ago, but it's long that I have not been. All right. Secondly, there is something that troubles me. I'm not too sure whether I did not uh, <coughs> get the full pack of your CVs. There are no references. To, you don't have uh, people that will refer us your character references in the CV. Yes, uh, it's not in the CV, but I can give you if you want to. Uh, no, no. To, to have those. Don't worry. Sorry? My point, what I'm saying is that there are no character references. There are no people that will ask us that they can confirm some of these things. We just write. It's, it's what you write yourself. We take it, and that's it. Was it not important? Was it not important either your chief magistrate or uh, some other prosecutors or some other person just to say, you no, know, these are the people who can confirm on these things? I should maybe apologize to say I omitted that because there are many people, as we speak, some occupying very high positions no. that can still. Such as, such as? Such as the person like the Chief Justice Mukwen Mukwen. Okay. Must for example, so, so that you have, yeah. yes, yeah. so so that you can contact him. Okay. Uh, uh, that's what I'm saying. It could have just been an oversight on my part no. to include that, no. and even my own prosecutors, no, the advocates in the uh, office. I, I will try. Sorry, I mean I do understand. Let me do this. I am not cross-examining you, of course. Of course, we will make an explanation. But I just want to. I was just picking up that yes. point. Mm -hmm. Now, the other important aspect for me. Um, a chief prosecutor, correct me if I'm right, is a leader in respect of a particular cluster yes. in that region. He, he deals with the prosecutors of specific number of districts, not the entire area. Province. Yes. yes. And that is the highest position that you have, at least uh, we, we have been up to now, the chief prosecutor. Yes. 
So you are a leader of a cluster up to so far. But yes. yes. Fine. And then coming to the question of uh, independence, I would like to know the NPA is not an arm of government separate from because we have only three arms of government, the executive, judicial and legislation. Where do you locate the NPA in these three arms of government? I, I locate it with the executive because it falls under uh, the, 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 the responsibility of a minister. Now, if it is so, what is the kind of independence that is outlined in terms of the act and the constitution required of the NDPP or the, yeah, the NPA. What is the kind of independence that, you, that they talk about? To my understanding, the independence that they talk about is about prosecutorial independence and discretion when it comes to taking decisions whether to prosecute or not to prosecute. But for now, I must say that NPA, we can't say it's institutionally independent because it's still part of uh, the, the Department of Justice. Now, now here is a Minister of Justice. He heard that there is an investigation of the member of the president. Oh, that member, let me put it differently. The NPA has decided to arrest a member of the NPA. He comes and says, hang on. I just want to consult. Is there anything wrong with that? Sorry? Let's say a Minister of Justice. Mm -hmm. you, you find out that as a head of the NPA, you have a warrant of arrest, you would like to arrest a member of the executive. And he approaches you and says, please don't execute this warrant. Wait, because I just want to consult with the cabinet, inform and sort out the handovers. Would you stop or would you proceed with a warrant of arrest? My take excuse me, on this is that for purposes of uh, cooperative governance, one should understand that if the minister comes and say, just give me a week or so, I want to deal with this before you effect or you charge the person. I don't see that anything wrong because one thing that we should realize is we cannot put this country into turmoil. We must be a responsible institution. The minister is not interfering with the decision to prosecute. The aim there is that give me opportunity to sort my house in order. I'll give you an example. To sort what? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to, to give an, a, an example. Uh, maybe that will clarify. Say it's a minister of finance. We know how the markets will react. If we wake up tomorrow, Titomboweni is locked or whatever. Depends on the reason. Yeah, yes, but mostly they, they, they do react. So, but if the minister could say, wait a minute, just give me a week, maybe they want to discuss with the president to say, at the moment when you are to charge this person, maybe we can shift the person not to be in that portfolio to avoid the turmoil that can result due to, to that. I, I wouldn't see anything wrong. What I would see wrong is when I'm told, don't... Mm, all right. On that point, <clears throat> we have often heard that the law must be applied even if heavens must fall. What is your understanding of that statement? That justice must always be blind. My don't understanding is <laughs> justice cannot always be blind. <laughs> I'll give an example why. Within the NPA, we have a program right now where we are dealing with cases by means of alternative dispute resolution. That's an indication or a demonstration that there are circumstances where you may not necessarily prosecute for particular reasons. Then it can't just be come rain, come shine. They have, but there has to be a reason why such a matter is not prosecuted. When I have to elaborate about the alternative dispute resolution, although I cannot say with certainty who started the whole project, 
But we find it useful in a sense that if people understand how it operates, say it's a, it's a young person who has committed, for example, shoplifting. It's, it's, it's just because this person was controlled by the youth kind of behavior or whatever, didn't really appreciate and understand what was going on. And this matter, say, it gets mediated. At the end of the day, we are trying to give this person a second chance in life. Because by having a criminal record, this person may eventually not find it easy to find employment unless if they follow said, the other procedure to impact the, 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 the conviction. So that's a demonstration that NPA also, as an institution, is not prosecuting like come rain, come shine. There are instances where a certain consideration is made. But that consideration should be seen as legal and not irrational. It should, it should be seen as not either protecting an individual for one reason or the other. It should be because we want to administer justice. Because administration of justice is not, it's not always just to tie people, throw all of them in jail and throw the key into the sea. Thanks. We still want these people to be rehabilitated. Thanks. No, I, I, we're just about to conclude on my part. Look, you made an example here about a minister of finance which would bring the economy into turmoil and all that. Now, there's someone to say, look, this is a good minister in this country and it's the first of his kind that we found. Don't proceed with the charges against him because to do so would uh, have an impact on the economy and other things and they point out at this level. What would be your decision? On that score, I will not agree. The minister will have to be prosecuted. The concession that I can make, like what I indicated before, is if I'm told, give us this period, we just want to put the house in order, but not to prosecute, that I cannot agree. My, my, problem, my point exactly, where do you get that concession? Based on what? How do you base that concession that you are making? That look, I'm not prosecuting. Must you find out whether the law allows? Well, how do you go about that? That's what the essence I want to get. Uh, to say we are not prosecuting. No, no, no. We are saying I'm not. I don't want to arrest this minister. I do understand the request that at least let's wait for two weeks before we arrest him. How do you go about that? You simply listen and take that decision, or you have to find out what the policy is, what, what, what the law, what is the guidance? Yes, of course the policies will come into place. Like I mentioned, uh, the NDP with regard to cooperative governance. Cooperative governance is not saying people shouldn't be prosecuted. It's just reflecting that there should be cooperation amongst various departments and stakeholders. So that at the end of it all, we are building the country. We are not destroying the country. So that uh, when one is going east, irrespective of whatever might happen, uh, uh, it's something that must really be considered. Last question. The, in 2000, I think it's 2005 or 2004, Mr. Bulalan and Muga make uh, the following conclusion in the after the investigation of former President Zuma said, look, we have a case here, a prima facie case against uh, Mr. Zuma, but this case we cannot prosecute him. How would you interpret that uh, judge, I mean, that decision? And would you, if put in the same way, would you make such a decision, such kind of a decision? Uh, without knowing what influence Bulelani not to prosecute because what was in the open was that it's not a winnable case. Because there are cases where it may appear prima facie, but getting deeper into it, you might find that it could be 50-50. So without knowing what influenced him, it might be difficult to be in his shoes. But if it's me, what I would look at is what the information that I have in the docket is there a case that I needed to prosecute, be it the president or not a president? Because here, the Constitution states clearly, all people are equal before the law, that there is no body who is but above the law. My point is that you, you convict him. He's saying there is a case, I have a prima facie case against this person. 
But I don't want to hear him. I don't want him to go to court. I would have taken that a such a decision. Can it be made? Is it a, can if you are put in the same? Would you make such a kind of decision? I wouldn't have. Mr. Machola. Thank you, um, Chairman. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Oh, uh, probably afternoon. it's afternoon. Well, excuse my error. <laughs> um, I, I like your approach to cooperative governance, you know, in the sense that you, you do understand that nothing hangs on its own somewhere. That, for example, the, the, the the Minister of, of Justice has to make sure that your courts operate and, and your, your prosecutors are paid and, and all that. He goes to cabinet and argues for your budget and the police investigate and they bring you the facts which is good for prosecuting and so on and, and, and so on. But I'd like just to understand from you what you think should be the ideal relationship between the National Director of Public Prosecution on the one hand and the Minister of Justice on the other hand. And also the NDPP on the one hand and the investigators and the Commissioner of Police and the uh, men and women that are in SAPS. The relationship between the Minister of Justice and the N NDPP if, if I'm following what you're saying. Yes, idea, the ideal. Uh, the, the ideal situation to me, I would prefer a prosecuting authority which is completely independent of any executive. That will resolve all the challenges, perhaps, mm. that we find ourselves in, in a sense that sometimes, I don't know whether it's misunderstanding of the <laughs> roles with relation to each other. And the minute that relationship is no longer healthy, unfortunately, it affects the, the, the institution. So the relationship, say, with the DG, with the police, and with other institutions, it's, it's important in a sense that uh, as the same justice cluster, people must be able also to share resources. There must be this cooperation on dealing with issues. For example, if, if there is no good cooperation, that's where you might find that uh, uh, the work that is supposed to be done by the other institution, now it's being taken over by the other. So if they work together and find a solution else to how should we move on relating to what we are doing. I'll give a typical example with uh, statistics. At the moment, the police compile their own statistics, for example. Prosecutors compile their own statistics. Sometimes we find that that statistics may not be talking to each other. And things that will encourage the police to work harder, which they regard as targets, is not part of the NPA. So, but if the two, they align, it encourages both prosecutors and the police to function together because the targets are almost similar and now it, it encourages both institutions to, to work together. So a, 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 a father of a 24-year-old young man uh, hears that you are about to arrest the young man for armed robbery and the young man has to get married in two weeks' time. And he comes to you and he says, Honorable NDPP, can you give me two weeks so that at least my son gets married before all this starts? Will you give him? I won't, because the example that I gave first, here we are talking of matters of national interest, which you cannot deal with it like a person who is just going to get married. I, I thought you, you, you simply said, if the minister comes to you and says, give me two weeks, you would you would give the two weeks no not really and, and i got a little bit confused as, as to how far this goes whether it's for some and not for others no I'm, i was referring to matters of national interest matters that will affect the country so that's when one should also look at at that 
And where does the interest of justice lie? For example, if, if a matter is likely to uh, affect the country, and you give the two... will be made. It's not just to say a case because the minister said, give me two weeks. It will be looked holistically. If I give the minister two weeks, will there be any other collateral damages that will not be recovered if that time period is given? Or if I give the minister that two weeks, there won't be any damage at all. Why should I cause the problem when it's just two weeks, for example, and nothing will really be of consequence in terms of the two weeks that was given. So it will be looked at holistically to say it's not just, it will just be given in that fashion. The public trust in the, in the NPA has been eroded. If you are recommended for appointment and uh, if you are appointed, what would you do practically <coughs> to restore the public trust in the NPA? The first order of day is to make sure that human resource is utilized wisely. For example, the NDPP has deputies. They must also be placed according to their strengths. I should say here that nobody can stand and proclaim to say, I know it all. But people have special areas where they specialize. It's to make sure that the human resource is placed accordingly, according to their specialities, so that we get the optimum results from how they are placed. And also to make sure that the public will be able to see that the decisions that we are taking are the decisions that are credible is that are the decisions that indeed when somebody looks at it doesn't find a reason why we should be dragged to court to say the decisions that we have taken were irrational for example thank thanks you. advocate Celia. thank you mr chair uh, good afternoon uh good Bukhari. afternoon uh, I only want to briefly deal with one aspect with you, and that is, uh, obviously you will agree with me that most of, if not all, the more important and serious cases are being tried in the high courts. Yes. You, uh, from, a, from an answer uh, to a previous uh, question, I understood you to say that you have never appeared in a high court yet. Yes because of the, the, the situation at your office. Uh, it's not nothing to do with your uh, abilities, obviously. Yes. Now, all I want to ask you is, seeing that the more important and serious cases uh, will be dealt with in high court, and you will obviously be dealing with people then much more experienced than yourself in that field, I suppose you'll accept that. Do you see that as any, uh, creating any difficulty or problem for you to, to manage the office of the NPA in the circumstances where the people that you have to advise and or instruct are much more experienced than you uh, uh, in this field of litigation? I don't find it as a challenge at all. Why? Because this complicated, high-profile cases. In most instances, you find that it's teamwork that is involved, like instances where it's just one person dealing with the matter. In actual fact, if I may look back of the previous NDPPs, who have also driven the process where high-profile cases were prosecuted, you still find that they didn't have the same kind of experience that somebody who is dealing with that high profile case is concerned. The most important issue, the role of the NDPP regarding that, is to identify 
the right people to deal with a particular case. Because somebody might be specializing in cyber, for example, but not uh, with uh, racketeering. So you'll find that those prosecutors, despite that they are experienced, all of them, they may be experienced in different fields. They still are able to work with another in fields where they are not strong because it becomes a teamwork. So I won't find it a problem at all. In actual fact, a great leader knows that when you are leading people who are far ex experienced when it comes to a particular kind of an offense, that's not what should make one feel threatened. In actual fact, that's the situation where you should give those people more responsibilities according to their strength. And you, Edward, if I ask you, uh, you have been in this post as chief prosecutor for the particular cluster for almost 20 years now. Yes. That's a rather lengthy time to remain in one position. Is there any particular reason for that? Uh, what you should understand is the way these positions are, are placed, it's something that has nothing to do with one's control. Where I have reached now, those are the positions where you could apply. What is happening here today is something different. To become a DPP, you don't apply. To become a Deputy National Director, you don't apply. To be a National di Director, you wouldn't apply until now. <coughs> so basically, if you are not nominated, you may not find yourself occupying those other positions. But, but the question is, is there any reason why you haven't been nominated for any of these other more senior posts? maybe that you presently occupy? That one I cannot know, I can, I, I can just speculate, because I have made an impact in this organization such that I believe even those that I work with wouldn't have any doubts that I can be capable to lead in every uh, position that is available. Because the objective facts are that the from your level to the uh, post that you now apply for is a rather big jump in, in, in position. Yes. Uh, presently you're occupying the position of uh, chief prosecutor of only one cluster in a, in a specific region. Do you feel that there may be a problem for you leading the, the NPA as NDPP coming from, from a rather junior post and going straight away to the most senior post in the organization? I don't find it as a challenge at all because like I said previously, when you are a great leader, you influence those who are below you and those who are above you, like what John Maxwell has said. Uh, the impact that I have done in our division, it's felt not only in my cluster, even other clusters that are there, every time when we have uh, 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 functions or meetings relating to performance, they always give me a platform to talk to prosecutors, including the DPP office, on issues relating to leadership, which shows that they, have, they are acknowledging and they have realized that this person has what it takes. So it's not a question about the person who is above you, because if I may clearly indicate, uh, with all due respect and all humility, not everybody who is occupying the higher positions are leaders. And that's the skill that we are not having in South Africa, because we are recycling people. It's like we are afraid of a change, to think if I take somebody down there, despite the person demonstrated the skills. It's like we are afraid for that change. And that's why we'll remain in that cycle, because we are not able to identify a person with those capabilities. Because what, if I have to quote again what John Maxwell has said, John Maxwell said, leadership is not the position that a person is occupying. It's what the person contributes to the position. And unfortunately, it's in, in so many instances, 
you find that there are people occupying those positions and some institutions which could easily be, become great are not because the person is a leader because of the position, not a leader because the person can contribute issues of leadership. That's our problem. And until we move away from that way of thinking, we'll deprive ourselves of new and fresh ideas. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Sikoko. Thank you, Chairperson. You, your CV speaks follow on your leadership, on your achievements, as well as educational qualification. Um, I want you to, to, to tell us or to share with us uh, if you are appointed or recommended to this position and you get appointed, if there is nothing that can compromise you are independent in taking these uh, prosecutor decisions. May I get you right? Do you mind to repeat? If, if there is nothing that, if you are not beholden to people who can come and try to give, to do, to exercise control over you and prevent you from exercising your independence. I don't have people who I think will try to influence me. What I have demonstrated by my way of living is that it's not easy. You won't find it easy to influence me for something that is wrong for me to do that. I cannot do that. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, uh, Advocate Manye. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ma'am Kari, I appreciate the fact that you, let me just say first, afternoon. Afternoon. Let me appreciate the fact that you went through the uh, case study that was presented to you. <coughs> Can I just ask you this question uh, on the case study before we proceed to other matters? On what basis uh, do you think uh, that the Mr. Ngwenya would have to uh, introduce uh, charges against the banker, Mr. Ivanov, if any, except for the ESA? of a whistleblower who's sitting somewhere in a foreign country. Uh, that's the reason why I, I said, if I remember correctly the facts, uh, that the whistleblower uh, bring an email making these allegations. So that's why instead of taking it to the police, I'm involving the IMU to try also to can find more information regarding this instead of because in the process we shouldn't trample on people's rights by just a whistleblower but on the other hand we can't just ignore because some of the issues have come into the open because of whistleblowers that's the reason why whistleblowers are to be protected okay appreciate that thank you in this case uh, the whistleblower remains anonymous correct yes and he's in a foreign country. In Mr. Ngonya's letter to the NDPP, he says to the DPP that, quote, I have evidence that confirms that Mr. Ivanov the banker has ulterior motives, close quote. Did you see that part? Okay, I saw that part. Maybe my apologies, I was talking about the, 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 the other one. Because the, the, the whistleblower in this scenario it's, it's a question that must be dealt with by SSA, not by the prosecutors. This whistleblower, it's, it's issues, because he says the, 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 the person concerned, his motive is to interfere with SSA. Therefore, it can be part of the prosecutorial uh, uh, matter. I, I believe SSA should deal with their... Uh, intelligence, they will be able to find what is uh, true about the situation. Taking from your answer, then, uh, how would you have dealt with Mr. Nguenya if indeed he came with those allegations? And he says, I want to proceed in prosecuting this person. You are now sitting as the NDP. What do you do? And he said, um, Sorry. May you repeat, please? I'm saying to you, taking on your answer, mm. what would you have done? If Mr. Ngwenya then came to you and said, this is what I have, 
from a whistleblower. Mr. Mwenye is a DPP, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And he goes to the National Director of Public Prosecutions with this information. How would you have handled that situation if your answer then is that, well, we'll just, you know, uh, hand it over to somebody else and not do anything about this because that's not our... No, to, to hand it over to SSA, it doesn't mean it's just to ignore it. Whatever the information has been collected, it's showing that this is the arena of SSA. That's the information that will take the case and what have you to SSA to say this. We don't have the mandate to conduct uh, uh, intelligence. Therefore, it must be taken to SSA. But now in his letter he says, I have evidence that this is the case. He's talking about evidence. Now, I don't want to go into the many other matters. When you read the case study, you find any way where you indicated that this might be an evidence that he's talking about. Like you said, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a whistleblower who remains anonymous. I try to picture what kind of evidence will this person be having, except information that could require some intelligence. In this case, it is not the whistleblower who says, I have evidence. It's Mr. Mwenya himself saying to you as a NDP that, I have evidence. That's what I'm trying to put to you. Okay. Yes. It yeah, comes that's from evidence. that he has evidence. That is the evidence that I'll try to assess to see if we have the mandate. I have the mandate to prosecute with regard to the information that he, he has. But from the given facts, you know that his information, supposed evidence, is the statement that was put to him by the whistleblower. Nothing further than that. Therefore, there is not credible evidence there. Okay. Let's proceed further then. Uh, In your cluster as the senior uh, prosecutor in the Northwest, have you ever experienced any uh, interference? I know that you spoke about your wish as to how things could have been conducted better. Mm -hmm. And I take from that then there are certain things that you did not want to disclose here that led you to say what you just said about certain things that were not done in a manner with which could have been dealt with better. Now I want to find out from you, is, is in your uh, cluster, have you ever, your decisions, have they ever been interfered with? Uh, I don't think there is any person who ever had an opportunity to can interfere with me. Maybe let me put it in this fashion to make it clear. The way I am strict and it's known, I even got sort of a nickname, and that's why people may not even want to try. What's a nickname? The Dragon Lady. A what? The Dragon Lady. Okay. <laughs> dragon so, Lady. So, so she spits fire, actually. <laughs> anyway. So, so it, it, I think the, the way I carry myself, even if you have other ideas, you may not try. All right. Thank you. Let me go back, back to the uh, case study. Anonymous, again, this time around, not from a foreign country, uh, sends a letter that says one of the highly decorated uh, prosecutor in that region uh, is not fit and proper person, but he's very successful. You said earlier that the NPA currently requires a person who would think out of the box. And the success rate of Ahmed Plagi, can that be attributed to thinking out of the box? His success rate in prosecuting all these matters that he has so been allocated with accolades, do you attribute that to thinking out of the box? I don't necessarily think it's thinking out of the box. What, what I was referring to when I talk about thinking out of the box, yes. I was referring to a leader who will be able to come up with solutions to certain challenges. This prosecutor is just a hard worker doing whatever he can do and he's 
he's getting whatever convictions, if that's what we may call the, 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 the performance that we can measure about him. Okay. Now, uh, you have been in the NPA for the long time, 20 years. And uh, it is clear from what you have said earlier on that you do not want to blame other people for all the ills that are bedeviling the NPA right now. Yes. You are aware of those issues that uh, are bedeviling the L uh, NPA, as you say. The issues that I'm talking about is, remember, I'm, I'm in the Northwest. Yes. Even though sometimes uh, uh, what is out there in the media may not be that accurate sometimes, um, it's what we hear, it's what we read. I, far away from the, the head office as it is, to can point a finger to somebody to say, this is the person causing all these problems. And when, when I, I, I say I must qualify my statement to say what we read sometimes in the media may not necessarily be correct. Uh, it's because I, of late, I was depicted as advocate Makari, a male attorney, uh, like Makari, a male attorney, something like that, and which was not correct. That's when I said to myself, but how can this happen? Couldn't somebody have verified the, 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 the right and correct names? Yes, Ma'am Makari, can I, I, I have a sense that you are actually uh, avoiding to answer the question. You stated that the trust, mm -hmm. public trust, in the NPA has been eroded. And you attributed that to certain decision making in the NPA. Yes. You didn't take that from the media, did you? No, we didn't. Yes, so you do know yes. about what I'm talking about yes. in the NPA. So it's not about what you read in the media, correct? Yes. Yes. No, uh, what I was trying to say is, one thing that I think it can be improved in the organization is when certain things happen, sometimes we communication doesn't come directly from NPA. For example, where there are issues like that, where you could say, this is what the organization is saying. Sometimes we can read that. But because in some instances there are cases that are in court and where the court has made pronouncements, that's when we are able to see that certain decisions were not really properly taken. Now my question is, were, that, were they interfered with those decisions when they were taken or before they were taken? Only for the courts then to come to the rescue of the NPSs. Listen, you now have to do what you have to do in terms of the law. I cannot say with certainty that the, 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 the decisions were interfered with okay. because I don't have any information to say that they were interfered with, but it gives that impression that something should have happened for a person to reach to this decision, which the courts will pronounce that it's an irrational decision. Thank you. Now, the independence of the NPA, as I spoke about earlier on, does it come with limitations? Yes. Which limitations? The, the, lim the independence. I'm referring in terms of decision making. The limitation here is if you're taking an irrational decision, obviously that, that's, it's, it's, it's a limitation on its own because you cannot just get a blank check like that to just willy-nilly take decisions that are illegal and irrational. In other words, you're sitting as the National Director of Public Prosecution, supposed to be acting independently. We know the Constitution then does uh, provide that you have to concur with the head of the uh, department, which is the Minister of Justice, certain decision making. Isn't that a limitation of your independence as the sitting head of the National Director of Public Prosecution? In terms of, if I may put it, administrative issues, okay. it becomes a, a, a limitation. Now, to the question that uh, Advocate Majola asked you about, and I suppose Mr. Majese also, also uh, touched on, to me it sounded as if you were talking about 
exercise of a discretion in considering whether to prosecute certain people based on other considerations, irrelevant or relevant. And then you decide then to stay off the prosecution of these individuals. Am I correct in, 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 in coming to a conclusion that you're talking about exercising a discretion? If you decide that you're not going to, if somebody comes to you and says, listen, do <coughs> not, for now, do this. And you accept to that. Yes, it's it's discretion. All right. Is it subjective discretion or, or dis, um, discretion or objective? It has to be objective. Where do we find those objectives of this exercise of this discretion? Where do we go to actually find determination that indeed this discretion was exercised objectively? Uh, because people who are looking from the outside may not have full facts. Yes. One might think it was a subjective decision. But in an ideal situation, it has to be an objective decision. What is it that we are looking at? at the end of it all. It's not about just to please a particular person. There is something that we are considering. For example, when I said, if that discretion that I'm, I'm exercising, I'm saying, you are requesting to say, okay, please don't charge this person today. Can you give me an opportunity to do this? And then it can be done tomorrow. The objective test here would be to what's interest, because it has to be in the interest of justice. It's not necessarily to be in the interest of the person concerned. It must be in the interest of justice and in the interest of, of, of national security. It must also be in the interest of, uh, the, the, of the country, in the in national interest of the country. So those are some of the considerations that one should look at. I must admit that I find uh you, you know, answered a bit troubling, which might then, you know, uh, maybe clearly shows why the public is still puzzled by how and why certain individuals are still roaming around freely with all the other things that have been, you know, uh, leveled against them. It might be as a result of the very same kind of discretion. If you do exercise that kind of discretion uh, and without any guiding document, when do you then decide to then exercise your duty by arresting or persecuting these people? If you go and say, I'll give you two weeks. Somebody can say, I'm going to exercise my discretion. I'm going to give you a year before I actually you know, proceed with prosecution. I mean, what I want to find out from you is, you speak so frequently about this exercise of discretion that we don't know where to find it. What informs it? Is it, and as I said, is it objective? Is it subjective? We don't know. And if it is it's subjective, how does it accord with the law? What does the law say? The, the discretion we are talking about, according to me, is objective in a sense that there is a directive, policy directives, which guides prosecutors in taking certain decisions in certain matters. So that policy directives will be able to guide as to what kind of a discretion should, should, should be taken. Thank you. You also spoke about the, uh, when, when Mr. Najoji spoke, was, uh, asked you about uh, the issue of with the uh, prosecution, you mentioned something about, well, it might have been 50-50. You, you remember saying that? Yes. Can you just go back there again and tell me what, what, what did you mean by saying 50-50? You saying 50-50, what, chances of success? Yes, chances of success. Is that a consideration? Sometimes uh, uh, there are instances where a case is not strong enough that Sometimes it's better to wait and gather more evidence before it's brought to court where I'm calling it 50-50. To avoid a situation that when it goes to court and the person is acquitted, obviously we cannot take the person back. So 
That's why I was talking that maybe it, it, it could be 50-50. But because these cases are now before the courts, which is an indication that it may not have been a 50-50 case, but when one was not there, when the decision was taken, you try to shy away from making a conclusive statement to say the person was taken this decision subjectively. So do I understand you correctly to say that you can only take a case to court if it is above 50 percent? Not that, right? not that. I said there are some cases yes. because of the complexity of the case. So if I may ask you a direct question, what would be the percentage that you would say that to take the case to court? No, there's, there's not, it's not necessarily a percentage if there is a prima facie case. Yes. But uh, uh, sometimes there might seem to be a prima facie case, but getting through to, say by the, the, the statement of the complainant, for argument's sake, when you get to other statements, you find that some statements somewhat contradict, some are corroborating. So those are the issues that you must also look at to say, is this the case that I'll be able to win in court, or am I going to lose it? No, no, I, 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 I seem to disagree with you. Uh, the, the level of your success in a matter doesn't lie with the N NPA, does it? Isn't it the court that has to make that determination of whether you are successful or not? Yes, but, the but the, the prosecutor who has the docket, yes. who has read the docket, yes. is able to know that with the information that I have, if I bring this information before the courts, are there any chances of success? But now the prima facie case that you're talking about has already been established. Yes. Here you're talking about the varying degree of the success of that, but you have already established that there is a prima facie case, yes. correct? Yes. And now you're saying that, well, even if I've already established that there's a prima facie case, I'm still not proceed to prosecute. Yeah, it, it's possible. But instances of that nature, as I must indicate, they are very few and far between. It's not like all the cases that the prosecution authority have, they are in that state. They are too far and far between. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Uh, just two questions from my side before we close. The issues that uh, the AG talked about emanating from your letter, the highs. When you started this interview, you talked about uh, once upon a time vibrant and proud NPA for you to serve. All the systems were in place. It had confidence of South Africans. But now, the laws, trust has been eroded and the trust must be restored and you need to end that respect you need the npa to be greater but in your answers i have not got into the specifics of what you meant by that if you can just summarize for us so that you can see this contrast of this once vibrant and proud npa and now the trust has been eroded I will summarize it by saying that um, at the moment, because we, have, we appear to have lost the confidence of the people because of certain decisions that are being challenged before the courts, what needs to be done is we, to bring back that confidence. How we to focus more on our mandate that we have been given by the Constitution and focus on this prosecution, prosecutions and people should be able to see and maybe if we are taking those decisions in a manner that are not questionable at times, there won't be a need for the court challenges. And on that score, the more we lose, we, we, we don't have challenges because of the decisions that we make, it on its own can instill that confidence again. And when the institution is not in a good state, the first sign is the morale that goes low, and we need to boost that morale again 
by focusing on what we actually are supposed to do and then bring back that, that morale as the prosecutors are starting to work harder, the people will then again have confidence in us. My last question, do you have any previous convictions? No, not at all. Is there any question you want to pose to this panel? I don't really have a question, I can just have a comment. Good. My comment that I have is, yes, I understand that some people may perceive a person who has never been at the High Court as not being able to carry me. Because where we come from, success in terms of uh, 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 in a law fraternity, it's been seen in terms of a person who has prosecuted high profile cases, difficult cases, but here right now, what we need is a person who will lead the institution, who will be able to know with the resources that I have, how much can I get out of this? What can I do to restore the morale of the staff? What can I do to bring back the confidence to the institution? Because an expert who is good, who has already won very difficult cases, may not necessarily have those attributes to lead the institution. And it comes back to what I was saying, that because it appears we, we, we are more comfortable with what we know, we become nervous, if I may put that word, to venture into the unknown. And in the process, we lose fresh ideas. We lose great people who could lead just because we have put boxes to say, if it's a leader, should have ticked this box and that box. Unfortunately, within the NPA, that's why we have court prosecutors and those who are leading others. And those who are leading others should have the attributes of a leader, should be able to lead, not just because a person has once prosecuted these difficult cases can automatically be seen as a great leader. Thank you. In the end, well, this panel is going to make an evaluation and assessment. Then we're going to recommend to the president. Then we're going to be informed as to the outcome of this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have to break for about 45 minutes. And we'll uh, be back around about uh, half past two, 22. Thanks. No, we we'll just... Pull, I get a the, 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 the extension. Dry puller and then do it. Stick and molar a big one to pick a jump. So that I should as that has a better connection because I had a molar to my phone challenge in killing the other